Okay, then um, I'm going to call the Town Finance uh, Committee meeting of July 23 to order at uh, five minutes after two, and thank everybody for being here. And um, there's a first order of business. I want to welcome three new members of the committee. I understand that um, if there is a process, and that Mary Lou told me that if there's a process where they have to take uh, oaths downstairs with the clerk and get certificates, they haven't um, actually processed that yet. But um, nonetheless, the um, council voted last night, and um, so I appreciate your being here. And uh, since uh, non-voting members, but important members of the committee. Um, I thought it was um, great to have you here, and um, I wanted you to sit up front and be able to participate as fully as um, you otherwise would anyway. So it doesn't re really matter that we haven't gone through any final process yet. Um, I'm going to start by um, going around with introductions and let the committee, all of us on the committee, introduce ourselves and then including the three new members and uh, uh, then um, just do a couple of logistical things and get on with the agenda. Um, and uh, I'm Andy Steinberg. I am um, a counselor elected at large and um, a member of and chair of the Finance Committee um, in its uh, current form. And um, so I'm going to now go all the way to my left and uh, start with Shalini and just ask you to each identify yourself. That'll get us around to the th new, our newest members. Hey. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome. So excited to have you all here with us. Uh, I'm Shalini. I'm a um, finance committee member as well as uh, district councilor from District 5. Hi, Kathy Shane. Welcome. Um, I wasn't able to vote for you last night because I just got off White River rafting, so I'm also trying to reconnect with this, this other world, but I'm glad to be here. And I'm District 1 councilor. Hi, I'm Lynn Griesmer. Uh, I'm District 2. Councilor, and I'm, it's my honor to be president of the town council, member of the finance committee, and I can't remember all the others. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Dorothy Pam, and I'm elected from District 3, and I'm a member of the finance committee and the community resources committee, and welcome. Now, you have to press the button as you speak, just so you know. Yes, and hold it down. Hi, I'm Mary Lou Tileman. I'm the resident finance committee member. Hello, I'm Sharon Povinelli, and I'm also a resident finance com committee member. Hi, I'm Bob Hegner, and I also am a resident uh, member of the finance committee. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask um, everybody else as they come forward to speak at various points during the meeting to identify themselves and um, and hopefully we'll just slowly get to know each other. Um, you've now got the logistics down of uh, using the microphones, um, except for the uh, position that I'm sitting in in the center uh, to speak. One has to hold, press the button and hold it so that the green light is on as you speak. We are being recorded by Amherst Media, and thank you very much, Amherst Media, for being here. And uh, uh, in order to be heard both within the room and by um, people who will be watching on Amherst Media, it is essential that people um, do uh, use their microphones as indicated. Um, there are just a couple other things that I wanted to indicate. One is that there's a logistics things that we're going to need to work out about um, getting you now, the new members, onto mailing lists and email lists and um, access to information. And uh, we will attend to that in due course, but not try and deal with that in the midst of the meeting. Um, and the other thing is actually I wanted to say to all members of the Finance Committee, uh, one of the things that um, is going to that that um, is a reality is is by expanding from five to eight. There's more of us, and um, 
that therefore um, each of us is, if we feel the need to speak, which is an important part of what the committee is, uh, we have the danger of prolonging what have been two hour meetings to much longer meetings. So I really um, ask everybody, and it's not, um, and this goes to the entire committee, to be conscious of time because we all have other responsibilities in our lives. And uh, so it's a cooperative effort that we all need to participate in. Um, so with that, um, I think that the first agenda item is um, having to do with the borrowing authorization. And it's actually a matter that needs um, immediate attention from the committee to refer back to the um, council. For people who are new to the process, um, one thing that's different in our new form of government um, in the way state law works is that there are um, these things called orders, which are um, financial um, orders that um, is what the um, council must pass to enact anything that is of a financial nature. And um, so what is going to be presented to us is a request to support an order authorizing borrowing for um, uh, work on the Centennial uh, Water Treatment Plant. And it would be funded not from the full budget, it would be funded um, as will be, I assume, explained from the um, Water Enterprise Fund. And um, if you're not fam familiar with enterprise funds, then we will explain that I'm, I'm probably outside of the meeting, but those are the kinds of questions that's reasonable to ask. Um, so with that, Mr. Bachman, um, are you going to do the introduction of this topic or? It's Jim. Yeah. Andy, I'll do minutes. You're switching Centennial okay, over you. to the overview of the building process. Gilbert's going to switch the agenda a little and start with number three with the overview of the building process. Okay, I didn't. I didn't That's know if you were going to do that first or wanted. No. No, you can do the uh, centennial. I don't. You want to do centennial? I was I? assuming we were doing centennial first. I don't know if there's anything to present on the screen to go with yes. it. No, centennial is quick and easy. Centennial is a water treatment plant we have in Pelham. It serves the Pelham Reservoir System, which consists of the Hills and Hollies Reservoirs. There's a memo you, we gave to you earlier explaining a little bit more about the system. Um, back around 2005, we started looking at redoing and rehabbing this facility. It's our oldest water treatment plant we have in the water system. We have three of them. We have the Atkins, we have what we affectionately call Baby Carriage, and we have Centennial. So we need to re upgrade it bring it up to speed. Um, it's actually had some casualties from lightning strikes over the last year, and it actually does not currently function. As we started the process back in about 2005 to redo this facility, we were just going to actually redo the facility. We were just going to use the same technology, put everything back the way it was, and just make it new and automate it a little bit. Um, we had to do a um, sewer line to make it work properly, and we've been, we planned a sewer line, and we also had to upgrade a pump station. The Centennial Treatment Plant is actually, the Centennial Treatment Plant is actually above the water grade line for the existing water system. So we had to take water from the Amherst system and pump it up into what we call the Pelham system, and that serves the Centennial Plant. So as we were putting all this together, we started the project, we installed the sewer line, we uh, did that in conjunction with a Mass Highway project to repave uh, Pelham, or Amherst Road, they call it in Pelham, Amherst Road and Pelham. We also installed the pump station, that's all done. As we were going through that process and going through those couple of years of doing that, it was about three years of process, uh, we found out that we couldn't just replace the technology we had at the treatment plant. The technology was not meeting the requirements that DEP wanted us to, wanted us to meet. Um, basically, um, our issue we were having with the chlorination byproducts, 
They're called HAAs, halicetic acids, and THMs, trimetho something. Um, THMs. THMs and HAAs. They're bad things. They're caused by um, organic material, leaf matter, um, debris in the water, acting with chlorine, and these byproducts are created. They're considered cancer, possibly cancer causing, and we have a certain level we have to keep below. And because this system is such a small system in the woods with lots of leaves and organic matter that falls into the reservoir, um, we were having a bit of a problem. So we've gone to a different treatment system, and that's what we're authorizing here. We're going to totally redesign the plant. Um, 600, and, 600 and some thousand dollars we're asking for it to redesign it. We're going to hire Tate and Howard to do it. We're switching from the traditional um, filtration process to a DAF process. Not Daffy Duck, but dissolved, dissolved air flotation system. Call it DAF. And it's much better at reducing all the organic material and not having as much um, byproducts, disinfection byproducts in your um, water system. So that's what we're asking for. Um, six, roughly 600000 for the uh, engineering and then... 692. 692, six, uh, six yes. 692. Uh, and then, then we go into the... Uh, and then we'll be coming back to you in a, probably about a year to bond and authorize the bonding for the actual construction, which will be a little more. If there's any questions. Questions? Yes, Dorothy. So the 692,000 is for the, the study, and then when you, you, to build it, what kind of money is needed? Uh, 600, 692 is for the design of the plant. Okay. The uh, rough cost now for actually the entire project will be $11 million. Okay. Uh, and the source of funds for this would be? The source of funds will be from the water enterprise system. This money is collected from the rate payers who buy water in the system. It's not from ta general taxation and it's not from the sewer funds or sewer rates. It's only from the people who purchase water in the system. Does that include the construction? Will also come from enterprise funds? That's right now that's the plan. Yes. I just have one follow up. Yeah. Do enterprise funds borrowing come under our cap? I guess I've been away too long. Not all of it. Um, it depends on whether it's voted inside or outside the debt limit. I believe a plant itself would be outside the debt limit, so it wouldn't count. Thank you. Yes. When we were reviewing the enterprise fund budget for FY20, was this already in that budget? It was. We did not put in the actual construction yet. We put in a placeholder for the construction. It was a little less than the total 11. But the uh, borrowing for the engineering was put into the cap. Into the and, and you had already figured it in to the, what it will do to the water rates yes. when we were voting on the water rates? We did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Lynn? I'm, unless we have more questions, I'm ready to move. Yes, and I think that. Um, what the motion would be that we, uh, that the Finance Committee would recommend to the Town Council. Uh, okay, go ahead. That we, that we appropriate and borrow order FY20-23 and order authorizing a borrowing for engineering service for the rehabilitation of the Centennial Water Treatment Plant treatment facility continued and then it goes on to the council later, but it would be voted today by the Finance Committee for recommendation to the council, and the council will bring it up at their meeting on August 19th. So the motion, is there a second to the motion? I second it. So the motion has been made by Lynn, seconded by Kathy, that the Finance Committee recommend to the council appropriation and barring order number 20-23, in order authorizing the borrowing for engineering services for rehabilitation of the Centennial Water 
treatment facility. No further discussion, then all in favor indicate by raising hands. So it's um, any opposed? It's five to zero. And uh, Kathy's taking minutes for us today. And hopefully very soon we will have a different system for minutes. Right now we have been rotating amongst committee members, but we're uh, working with the uh, manager to um, have people who are actually hired to work to, to do minutes for committee meetings. Uh, we're taking turns until then, and uh, we'll call on everybody to help if need be. But thank you, Kathy, for doing it today. So um, then, moving along to the second to the next agenda item, which is the um, building uh, process presentation. So what I had asked um, while uh, Guilford's getting set up, I had made this request for the education of the entire committee and uh, to inform our next rounds of discussion that all have to do with capital items, um, a little bit more of an explanation about the entire process for uh, building buildings and how things move from, uh, as you go through the process, from feasibility study to schematic design, the OPM process, approval for funding, contracting, of which there are two different kinds of options um, under uh, Massachusetts law for municipalities to use the construction and the completion acceptance of buildings and how it works so that we have an understanding of the construction process because most of our summer is going to be one way or another dealing with um, issues of uh, capital projects. While we're waiting for that, Andy, just again for the benefit of our new members in the audience, um, Amherst has not really had a very large construction process since 1990. And so, um, it's, we feel like as we move into the capital project phase of hopefully some new buildings for the town, uh, that it's important for people to have a greater understanding of what that public process looks like. In the 1990 building was the police station facility. Okay, thank you. So hopefully this goes better than that. Um, okay, so I think we did this once before with this, the entire select board, we did, our entire council, right? Yes. Okay, so if I say anything and I bog down, just point to me to go faster and I'll go faster. All right, so these slides were taken from the, were given to us by the Massachusetts Inspector General's Office, and this is what they use when they actually teach this class. Um, the, there's actually a program called the Massachusetts Certified Public Procurement Officers. Um, in town, we have um, Holly Bowser in the accounting office. Um, we have Sean from the schools, myself, and Amy Rod uh, Rizeki, who's in my office. We're licensed, we're certified, and Anthony Delaney is. So there's a group of us who go through this training. There's refresher training, we have to go through it a lot. Um, the refresher training is great because we think we know something, we find out it's been changed by the legislature and we have to learn it a different way. So it's always, whatever I tell you is, it is changing and it's constantly being updated. Um, so but this is the slides I use in this class. I took some of the slides out that you don't really need to see, which are the boring ones, and left you the really exciting ones. Uh, but don't get too excited because I'll start to worry if you do. So for the designer selection, we have a, a, this little table kind of lays out what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Um, design services, if you um, have a design fee of over $30,000, your construction cost is over $300,000, you have to follow MGL Chapter 7. Um, construction services, if it's over $10,000 and it's a building, you gotta follow MGL 149. There are a couple other things um, 
that apply, and we'll talk a little bit about this a little later. Public works is all to the right. There's really no rule that tells me, it tells a public works person how to choose a designer. We're supposed to use best practices in choosing designers for public works projects, or what we call horizontal projects. Um, if it's construction services, once you get into building in public, in chapter, in a public works type stuff, we're supposed to be anything over 10,000, we have to use chapter 30B to, to buy it and procure it. Um, there are some exceptions for mass support, for UMass, and all those people. They have their own little rules. But these are the rules we have to really kind of apply for here for uh, municipalities. <clears throat> the basic process is you, you plan, you design, you bid it, you build it. Design, bid, build. That's the process that it normally goes through. There is another process that we're going to talk about, which is a little different today, but that's your basic basic flow of how something goes. Do you want the questions now or later? Uh, it's up to you. Go ahead. Since the design costs seem to be so high in each of these projects, is there a bidding for the designer? The bidding for the designer is controlled by the table I just told you here. So if it's a building project, you have to do a type of solicitation, and I'll get to that later on, for the designer. Uh, public works, like I said, the designer, you're supposed to use best practices to choose that person. Uh, owner. We have a lot of terms when we talk this process. The owner is us in these projects for the town. We're the owner. The people of the town, the uh, staff that's going to use it, those, 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 you're the owner. Uh, Construction manager. A construction manager is someone who's going to manage the process. Um, you can choose to have a construction manager or you in a big project, or you can choose not to have a construction manager in a big project. Most of our public works projects, the construction manager falls to someone in the public works office to handle. In a building process, you can hire a construction manager to be your construction manager. That's also affectionately used to be called the clerk of the works. It's kind of the same, same thing, a clerk of the works. That's the person who can do that. It's optional. It's not really required. Um, <clears throat> we do have a requirement now to have an owner's project manager. If your project is going to be over $1.5 million or more, you're going to have to hire an owner's project manager. And this was kind of a way to say, it's nice to have a construction manager, but we're going to require a construction manager for some projects. And this is it. The owner's project manager has to be qualified to do the work. They have to be basically be someone who's skilled in that type of work. So if you're building a building, it's usually someone who has experience in buildings. So it's usually another architectural firm. You can have a person on staff do it. If you want to do that, you have, have a person who has some experience with it, and they can be the owner's project manager and be responsible for it. The issue you have is making sure you have a person who can do the whole project or you can switch in the middle. Like right now for the public works building and the fire station building, um, I'm serving as the owner's project manager. As we move into the next phases, we're going to have to hire someone else to start taking over who has a little more experience in buildings besides my experience in buildings. So that's something that's going to come up is there's going to have to be an owner's project manager hire at some point. And, that, and it does, the rules do allow you to start with an in-house person and then go to an uh, outside person if you want to. And the rules also allow you to stay with an in-house person if you want to. Um, the owner's project, man oh. owner's project manager is really meant to be there to help the town and help the community it doesn't normally do this. Most people don't do this very often. The owner's representative, if the project's going to be over $50 million, you have to have another person called an owner's project, man project representative. Um, the public works and fire air is not over that. Schools may be hitting this owner's representative threshold. And then, of course, you need the designer. The designer is a person who you know, is developing what you want into a scope of service, a budget, a schedule. They're going to make the detailed plan specifications and they're going to be with you through construction they're going to be the people making sure what they designed is built um, that's really their whole purpose in life 
sorry. And then you have the contractor. So the contractor's person who built it. So the people who make up this whole project are the owner, the owner's project manager, if it's over one and a half million dollars, the designer, and the contractor. Those are the key players you're gonna to bring to the table to put your building together and move forward. And this is kind of a, a, a little table that shows you how it all goes together. Owner, OPM is off to the right, contractors, designers, and then designers and contractors can have subs. And OPM can have a sub too. Uh, when we were talking doing the school projects last time, the OPM actually had a sub who was uh, skilled in doing uh, Yeah, I don't, they, they had a special sub that they had to help them with something they were doing. I think um, it was around the zero energy. No, it wasn't. This was with the schools a while back. Oh, okay. Um, it was something else. But you can have subs too. But this is the basic layout. All right. So the, let's see. This is the slide uh, we kind of added in here. Um, another way of doing this instead of doing design, bid, build is we actually do design it with design it with the builder with already hired and then build it so you kind of do design you kind of have your designer and builder team together and they work together to give you a design and then they work together to build the building so it's called uh oh, my brain is just kind of dying today it's called construction management at risk and this is possible to do if it's over five million dollars um, you do have to get approval from the state to do it. It's not something you're just allowed to do because it's relatively new and a lot of people mess it up. What you're trying to do is you hire OPM, then you'll hire a designer, and then you'll hire your construction firm that's going to build your project. But you don't have a design. You use your, your, your designer and your builder all work together to build, give you what's supposed to be the best design and project you can have. So that it's, the thought is, is that the contractor and designer working together gives you that product. So that's the other way of doing this. Um, we can talk a little bit more about it. You'll probably have a lot more questions about it. Um, when you choose your designer, when you choose your OPM, and when you <coughs> choose anybody who's in the design team, you have to do a qualifications-based selection. You can set a dollar figure not to exceed, but you can't tell them, you can't make your choice based on price. You solicit qualifications from firms. If you want the perfect firm that's done like a million fire stations and you say they have, have to have done a million fire stations in their career, that's your, quali that's your, quali your qualification statement. So you put together your, what you want, your qualities, your desire to be, and you choose your your, your designer based on those qualifications. Um, it's not based on money. So in this building process, I'm getting a lot of weird looks. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say it again. Am I, does anybody have a question to help me get off my? Hi. Um, where in the process is there any um, independent cost estimate? that the town does or someone else does to kind of put a re grounding in reality on cost. Okay, so that's done during several places during the design process. You can choose multiple places to actually do that if you want to. But it's usually in the design process that you'll have independent estimate verification. So, but, <clears throat> does everybody understand what a, a qualification-based selection is? You choose somebody based on their qualifications, not based on the price they give you. You don't go to your friend who says, I'll design this for 20 bucks for you when it's really going to cost 400,000 bucks and you, your friend really doesn't know what he's designing. You want a schoolhouse and you want to get a doghouse. That's, that's what the qualification based statement's for. You have to do that for both the OPM and the designer. Dorothy? Um, this is state law? Yes. Okay. Because you can make your qualifications, you can custom make them to fit just only one or two people. Uh, I don't see how it avoids um, graft or anything. 
if you do that, you're going to probably get a number of people complaining about your solicitation to the IG's office, and you'll have to go do it again. So as you write this, you have to be understanding the fact that people are watching you. There's people who want to do, your business, do business with you, and if you restrict them from doing business with you and they think it's unfair, they will complain to the IG, and the IG, the Inspector General, will make you change it and do it again, <coughs> regardless of what you've done. Okay, we're going to go ahead, and then I will, I'll get into the questions that I have after you, it's because you may cover them. Okay. All right. Oh, so that, that's, that's basically the overview of how, uh, hold on, let me get back. <coughs> so that's basically the overview of how the process goes and how you would make your selection of your designers. Um, like I said, there's a bunch of slides I hid, but you really don't want to see those. They're great question slides for the test that we have to take when we do this thing. So then designer contracts. So once you decide you're going to do the designer, you have to do the quali qualification based. Um, all your designers must be licensed and certified to work and seal their designs in this state. You can't hire someone from California who's more experienced in something just because they're more experienced. They have to have someone in the state of Massachusetts who can sign and, and stamp their drawings. These are the stages of the design process. You have a planning stage, which usually can go on with or without the design, with your designer. Sometimes you have a pre-planning pre, pre stage, and then you go into a planning stage once you've hired your designer. And then you do go into the design phase, which is schematic documents, and you kind of lay out what you're gonna do. You do a develop your de documents fully, and then you have your construction documents. That's the point where you're ready to say, <coughs> yes, I'm gonna do this. You develop your bidding documents and you start doing bidding and you start doing your construction. So this is kind of the layout of how the process goes. Planning, design, construction. And then design is kind of broken out in the steps. Where does the feasibility study um, fit into that? Is that the planning study? Yes. If you do a full, uh, if you do a, um, if you do a feasibility study, if you do a, something that's formal, a formal feasibility study, that's the word I was looking for, you would do it in the planning process. Because that'll give you the information you need to go on to your design. So um, I'm gonna continue on that for a second and we can use either DPW or FIRE as examples because they're the ones that are probably along farthest in this right now. With those, we have had feasibility studies that were done and they put numbers on that. Um, how realistic to the end result are those numbers and how did they, um, you know, what was the process to get there? How, lo how deep a dive into needs and costs were made to get there? The, the number you mean and how much the cost is or how yes. much square footage? Cost. Okay, <clears throat> so in, in our feasibility study for the, for the DPW and the fire, um, those numbers are based on industry standards for square foot cost. And there's also a contingency added in there because when the feasibility study is done, there's no site chosen. So you have to make some assumptions. You assume that you've got the best site you have possible, and if you do that, then if you have the rockiest site available, then your cost will go up. If you have a site that has poor soils, your price could still go up. Um, if you actually find the perfect sweet spot site, your price may be very close to what they quote you. But in your feasibility study, it's based on industry standards for cost and rules of thumbs, and there's some contingency built in for the unknowns. Yeah, Lynn and then uh, Kathy in that order. So really two questions that, um go with this. If you look at this process and you look at the two different approaches that you're allowed to do, the more regu regular one and the newer one, at which point do the individuals get involved in, say, the original process and the newer process? Okay, so if you're doing a, a, your basic design bid build process, you're going to hire, before you do your formal feasibility study, you're going to hire your OPM, 
and you're going to hire your designer. Once you finish your formal for feasibility study and you've finished your schematic designs, your schematic drawings, at that point, you're going to start looking for your, if you're going to do a CM at risk, you're going to build a con you want a contractor, you want to hire him before you go beyond, any farther beyond where you are. Meaning? Meaning before you go to design. Before you go into the final phases of the design, you're going to have your- For the construction. You're going to have your construction manager, construction at risk person on board, your contractor on board. If you're going to wait and do the formal or the old traditional design bid build, you'll wait until construction bidding to bring on your, your builder. Okay. And my next question then is, I assume that it is, at what point, and maybe Sonia would be part of answering this, at which point in this process does the decision come back to the council as to whether to go ahead with the construction and fund it and or go out for a debt exclusion override? I'll, I'll, I'll take a first crack. Mm -hmm. So the way we've been funding this process right now is we've been funding each step as we go along. So every time we get ready for the next step, that's the step where the council gets to say, hey, project's up or project's down, and then how you choose to fund it, whether it's a debt exclusion or whether it's under the general Mm -hmm. So right now, we've already funded the feasibility studies for DPW and fire. Our next decision as a council will be whether or not we're going to fund the schematic design studies for fire and DPW. Your, your next one is schematic design was kind of done in the feasibility studies as well. We have our schematics. It'll be the design development documents and the construction documents as our next phase for fire and DPW. Okay. And in those, both of those instances, we still need to bring in the net zero. You need to start thinking about that then, yes. Yeah, I would hope so. All right, and then the third phase, obviously, for debt ex for any kind of debt is when you actually move to construction. You can, I mean, it's up to you, the council, and this what your financial advisors tell you about whether or not how you can pay for the construction design. If they tell you that there's if you are going to do three design processes and they're going to say they're going to bond all three of them, that would be a debt exclusion or a debt process there. Not necessarily debt exclusion, but a debt um, borrowing versus taking it from what's available in the money pool. And, and no one's thrown anything at me there, so I think I got that right. Sonia? So there can be um, many parts to borrowing. You can, you can borrow for each part of this individually, each project individually, or you can pull, pull it all together depending on the timing of when um, cash flow is needed. So that's what, it, that's what that depends on. And we do a lot of bond anticipation notes to provide for construction up until the project is done. And then we do a, a complete borrowing as to whether it's a debt exclusion override or not. I, that's a council, that's a town. Right town decision, political decision, which is going to be a debt exclusion and which ones are that's not really the treasurer or the finance directors. Good. Kathy. If, um, to what extent when you're in the going for the full design, can you be interactive? So you can, um, if I think of building a house, I say I've got, I don't want to spend any more than 30 million, 25 million or 10 million, whatever my number is. Um, but but you, something comes back to you and say, what do I give up or can I do it in phases while still meeting the standards for let's do fire department or DPW, but we can do some part of it less expensively, but there's some core pieces we have to do this way. Is there that kind of interactive discussion? That type of interactive construction discussion can go on throughout the whole process actually if you think about it. And it depends on the types and the levels of discussions you're having. Deciding on whether to build a, um, a Cadillac version of a DPW versus a non-Cadillac version, that can happen pretty, pretty soon. Um, if you want to have gold-plated um, floor coverings, that's, that's pretty, you know, that's something you can decide pretty, pretty early in the process. 
Um, <clears throat> throughout the whole process, you're going to get to a certain point and look at the price and say, is this price acceptable? And this is what I'm getting for this price. So we have a price right now for fire and DPW. So the question is, based on where we are in the process, is that acceptable or not? And if someone says, no, that's way out of the ballpark, we're not going to do it anymore, you can say that. And that's you know, why we've broken it up into in the phases of how we design it. So you could say, we're not going to pay that much money, but we're willing, can, what can we get for this much money? And you can adjust a little bit. And, and since we're already at the end of one phase, what you would do is maybe say that. And then when you go out for your next designer, you would say, this is what you're looking to do. Or when you go to the next phase, which is the design process, you tell the designer, this is what we want to do. And this is the ballpark we want to stay in. And when you say you, is that a committee? Is that a group of people? You know, I'm just thinking of, you know, we've it's, got, it's as choice. you know, we've got a whole bunch of buildings lined up here. And if we say, here's, here's what the total, but the total could be less if each of these came in less expensively. Um, so that interaction with the people who live in a DPW building might want a different, I mean, I don't even think of Cadillac as my standard anymore. I would like a good, sturdy Prius version. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, but one that is completely functional, but doesn't have frills, uh, but that we won't say 20 years from now, boy, did we make a mistake because we cut a corner here? If, um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, um, you threw me off with the cut the corner thing. Yeah, no, I was just saying when the you is like, like you alone, the, the, like a committee. The you, when I say you, I mean the owner. Yeah. So however the owner defines yourselves, if the council says the owner shall be a committee that shall manage this for the town and for the owner, that committee, the town manager still has a say in how things go because most of these committees that do these things report back to the town manager. Um, so. The town manager is responsible for, for coordinating all that stuff, so he would actually, if you want to coordinate more of the three buildings all at once, that would go there, although I don't think the buildings are in a position to be coordinated all together. Only the police and our DPW, I keep saying police, DPW and uh, Public Works would be able to be coordinated together. Don't start rumors. I know, it's weird. Um, so actually, so planning stage, this is what we, what we were kind of already talked about this a lot. More of, the, more of the planning stage study. This is what's already been done for police and fire. I mean, DPW and fire, I did it again. And then our deliverables, yes, we have schematic drawings of what each space size should be. And we have a preliminary specification for each space and we have a cost figure for each space. That's, this is what we've already done. And now we need to go into this phase for the DPW and fire. Plans and specifications. If you decide you want to do CM at risk for DPW station or for the fire station, you would bring on your CM at risk at this point in the game before you start your plans and your specifications because your CM at risk is a, a member at the design table. These are your deliverables from your design process. As you go forward, and if you use CM at, CM at risk, what you'll also have is your maximum price your CM, is, your building is gonna co cost you. Because you've already brought your Builder on, and he's gonna be willing to do it. He's already told you what the price is, and you're gonna know what the price of the building is before you bid it, because you've already kind of done that. The CM at risk allows you to develop that number while you're doing the design, in a sense. The CM risk, CMs at risk are paid a flat rate for for um, <coughs> their services, plus an actual cost of the items. So if they put in 40 square feet of floor and the 40 square feet of floor, the rate of flooring is $20 a floor. They're paid for that. Plus there's a fat, flat rate that goes with that. That's negotiated when you bring them on board. So you kind of know one of, the, one of the benefits, two of the benefits of a CM at risk is you, you know your price as you're, as you're building your project. The other thing you know is 
um, who's doing it, and they have an idea exactly what they're doing. There's no risk that someone will misinterpret the design plans or specifications during the bidding process. One of the drawbacks of a CM at risk at this stage is if you're truly going to do the DPW project and you're going to say, well, we're going to build only phases of the project and you haven't told your CM at risk you're doing that when you bring him on board, you've kind of messed up his pricing scheme and you've kind of put him at a disadvantage and he may not want to be part of your process and he may not like that. If, so if there's lots of big changes you're going to make in the design as the de design goes on, you may not want to use CM at risk for that. If you know pretty much where you're going with the picture, mm -hmm. CM at risk will be able to help you see a better picture as you go along. Did that make sense? Yes. Me? Dorothy. Does the CM at risk result in good design? I mean, I, the, the first part, design, bid, build, made sure that the designer was not connected with any of the other people, that it was independent, as if that's a good thing. The CM at risk is not independent. And um, I, I just remember recently Amherst Media was told, go back and get an architect. You don't use the con contra contractor to do the design. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is this a good thing? So CM at risk, like I said, has plus and minuses. When you actually hire your CM at risk and when you advertise for one, they cannot be affiliated with your designer. Whoever you choose as your designer, if they have a CM, a CM at risk part of their business, that part of the business cannot bid on the project. They have to be totally separate and independent. So in the process, you're still having two separate independent people working for you. There's no ability for occlusion that way. And if there is occlusion, someone will find it and they'll tell the IG and the IG will come talk to you and all that good stuff will happen again. Okay. Um, so, so during the construction stage, this is what your designer, these are your tasks your designer has to do. Um, your OPM is also doing these things as well, keeping track of what's going on, making sure that there's um, accountability from all three, all, both the parties, so you actually have three checks going on during the process. The contractor's giving you something, the OPM's giving you something, the designer's giving you something. And then this is just more about the designer selection law, which we've already gone over several times. And that's... So the price um, that we conceive of for building, for example, the ones we're working on right now, we've talked about is DPW and FIRE as being farthest along. We have a number from feasibility of what we, th um, you described how it was calculated. It was a rough figure based upon square footage without knowledge of the site or factoring in those details. Then you get into the schematic uh, when you know that there's a site available. Uh, and that gets to something that you take out to bid, assuming especially that we're uh, going on the design bid build process, uh, you don't know that contractors will actually bid for the, uh, the amount of money you envision until they bid, I assume. And uh, so it seems like the number can still move throughout the process, at least until that point, possibly later if there are things that are discovered in the construction. So how much variation amongst all of those numbers is um, common? So <clears throat> depending on how well your project goes is, you know, if you get a 10%, if you bring your project in under 10%, you're usually like, you're golden, you've done a good job. So if your estimate was this number and only go over 10%, that's a really good job. Um, in the market we're in right now, you, you have a bit of volatility going on. Um, we have some issues with uh, fuel prices. We have some issues with steel prices. And, and those are things you really can't factor in and things that may change as the whole project goes along. Um, you may, in, I mean, 
the, the quickest, the best way to do this is be as fast as you can. Design it, get it built, keep it in a short window. The price you have for the DPW building already is three years old. So you take those numbers, you, they have to be inflated a little bit because prices have already changed. We have steel, steel tariffs in place. Um, we're, we're having, we have price increases on things that aren't made of steel because in order to get them, there's some steel thing in them or steel process going on and the price is a little more expensive. Uh, there's more things having, having tariffs put on them. Those drive up the cost. Um, my, my standard answer for anything is it takes you four to, four to eight weeks to get it. Um, that's going on too. So <clears throat> the more you can control your project as far as how fast you want to go, what you know what you want to do and get things going, you'll have a lower price. The, D, the fire station was finished in 17, so it's only, that number is only two years old. So um, those things factor in. And it's hard to tell because the market can change or things can change. Um, UMass could have another building boom. If UMass has another building boom, um, then we're going to be short builders. And then you're going to be asking for builders to do something when they really don't want to do it because they have plenty of work to do. So they're going to charge you a higher price. If you have a building decline at UMass, there'll be plenty of builders with nothing to do and you'll get really good low prices because people want to work. Um, that's kind of the nature of the construction industry and how it goes. Okay, great, Lou. I've, excuse me, I've, I've listened to the uh, architects for the Wild, Wildwood and Fort River and both of those, I guess they're designers now, um, have come in with you know, several different models that you could look at. Is that what would happen with these projects that once we hire the designer, you could say, show us a building at 50 million, 60 million, 70 million, so that you're not designing for the very best and then trying to scale back if we decide that these projects all of them together are quite expensive. You could take that approach if you wanted to. Um, the approach that you should probably take with a fire and DPW is um, what, what features do you build on? We need an administrative office. We need this much, we want this much heated space versus this much heated space. Um, put together a package not of um, not based on a value, but based on building certain components of your, of your project and seeing how it comes that way. That would probably be a better way. But you could say, we only want to spend $30, or $30 million, tell me what it is. We only want to spend $15 million, tell me what it is. You could do that. That's up to the process and how you choose. So looking at the two projects that are furthest along, um, you really can't split up fire and EMS. I mean, they, they're the same people, they have to live in the same buildings, and there's only gonna be one of those buildings. So you can't say, gee, what would happen if we didn't have the EMS equipment in that building? On the other hand, with the DPW, there's actually various departments spread around the town, some of which can be moved and some of which can't be moved. For instance, right now, parks and recs are off in one area, and a building that would be built with parks and recs would be bigger than if we say parks and recs isn't going to move into that building. Another option to look at is, are we going to have a community room in each of these buildings, or aren't we going to have a community room? Community rooms double as training rooms. So there's those various things that can help us trim costs, but some of them we can't compromise on because fire and EMS are the same people, so. Right. It's Shelley. Just a clarifying question to follow up on what Mary Lou was asking. So we could give specifications, of course, but could we ask for different configurations? Different configurations and as in costs. how buildings are, our buildings are set up? Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, and, and different price ranges. Well, once when, when you kind of, the way to go would be different configurations of the building, and then you, then you can price va or engineering value, look at the value of different types of materials, um, look at the values of different types of spaces, 
Um, I, I, you know, the ideal, <laughs> the ideal DPW, I saw this in a, recently we were out in a, another country looking at their DPW and it was gorgeous. <laughs> and it was like, it was a Cadillac. Every space was heated to a nice ambient temperature, um, nice and warm inside. You could walk around in a t-shirt and shorts, the whole, whole place. Um, but that's not, that's not what we need, you know. I, the DPW has certain vehicles that have to be kept above freezing. They have certain vehicles that just need to be undercover and kept out of the snow and the wind and the elements. Um, so that's kind of how you want to look at it. And but you could say we'd like to see what a one-story versus a two-story would look like. Yes, if you, okay. but then what's one, two, yeah, you can see. What, but what would be in those one or two stories? Right? Yes. So let me just for everybody to remind you of the flow of this meeting, what we're trying, what we're trying to accomplish today, and the order in which we're going to do it. Because then, if there are additional questions for um, Guilford, I want to then get that out of them, so that he can get on his way to other things. Um, the council had referred to this committee and the community resources committee the responsibility to look at um, a request from the public arts commission for percent for arts proposal and um, that um, is of course um, going to be at, if it is as they propose it a part of building projects so i wanted to have that as the next item on the agenda uh, because we do have a responsibility to do a preliminary report back to the council and uh, so I wanted to get some discussion of that going so Public Arts Commission is present. Uh, then um, the next thing I think that I would like to take up um, because it gets back into an issue that um, uh, Lynn had raised earlier, which is when do you make the decision as to how to finance a project um, and uh, whether it be debt exclusion or uh, be uh, funded just by general um, authorization of bonds from other sources. And so um, Sean has been working with us for some time on um, an analytical tool to help us look at that issue. So I would propose that we then go to that um, presentation because I think it just, it sort of is part of this flow because today is really to get us moving on a res big responsibility we have, which gets to then um, the last item that I want to at least get some discussion on, but we may have to limit it depending upon time. But we have to start thinking about what is the decision-making process that we're proposing for um, the entire community to make decisions on these uh, projects. And um, today was really about providing information that is um, feeding into that process. But we then have to start talking about the process itself. So just so everybody understands the agenda and the intent of the agenda. Um, are there other questions for Guilford now that um, we see where it's going of things, knowing where it's going that you want to ask now because otherwise we want to thank him for being here. Let him get on to other things. Bob. Yeah, I just have a general question in terms of the process for the change control management process. In other words, in any construction project, you always have a change and a change order. And how is that going to be managed? And at what point does that go either to the committee or, or to the council? So it, we haven't actually talked about how, to do, how we would do that. Let me, I can tell you how we do it now for our regular projects we do. And then I assume it would be basically the same, the same process. Um, so um, in a public works type process, when we have a change order, we look and see, make sure if it's in the scope of the work and if it's inside the scope of the money we have available. Because we always have a little contingency built into the project. If we're in that, we're okay. We usually authorize it if it's all right. If we're outside the scope of the project or outside the scope of the money that's authorized, we go to the town manager and we discuss what to do and whether it's going to be approved or not. Um, if it's approved and we have no money to be used for it, then we have to come to the council for an authorization of money. So 
as we talk about these bigger projects and we decide whether they're going to be a building committee or so forth, those things would probably be worked out in the steps and how the committees will work. Because with a committee, you'd also probably you'd bring the committee in. And well, I've seen this in other places. You'd bring the committee in as well and say, this is what the change is. This is what it is. And they would have to make a recommendation as well. So it's something, it's a good question. And it's something that will have to be worked out. And right now, how, that's how we do it. And I assume it would just be expanded as we go forward with the bigger projects. Uh, and I, as we move into the net zero, <laughs> you know, it's like these windows could cost this or they could cost that, but then what will they return in energy savings? So, and that's a black box for us, but not for all communities, but not a lot of communities. So it's going to be a real challenge. And there's one additional piece, and uh, Sean may speak on this a little bit later if he has time and inclination, and that is that we also have partners in the building process for some um, of our buildings that we're talking about, library and schools, and um, going straight to the schools, Mass School Building Authority um, has a definite role to play in um, changes that we make and uh, how the, they're very much a part of the process because they're a partner in the process in many ways, including paying for it. Um, so that's another factor that we all have to recognize. Anything else for this phase for Guilford? That. Guilford, thank you very much. This has been extremely helpful, and I appreciate your time this afternoon and providing this for us. It was really great. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, I think we, what we want to do is keep moving and um, uh, ask our, our bill from our Public Arts Commission uh, to come forward, introduce himself, and uh, he's going to make a presentation about how public arts fits into building projects as the um, envisioned by the Public Arts Commission. Do I have that correctly? Uh, close. <laughs> okay, then go with it. Thank and you, Andy, and thank you to the Finance Committee for having me here. My name is William Kazin. I live 32 Goldenrod Circle here in Amherst. And I am the new chair of the Public Art Committee, and I'm here to present to you on the Percent for Art Bylaw, and more generally on public art and its value to a town like Amherst. Um, so this should last around five minutes. It might go a little bit longer. I'll do my best. If I'm speaking too quickly, I apologize. Thank you for having me. So what is public art? Um, public art is art that is available to the public for free. And when we talk about the percent for art bylaw that town meeting passed over two years ago now, but that still hasn't taken effect for a variety of reasons, which we may or may not discuss today. We're talking about publicly funded public art, meaning that uh, typically some portion of a town or city's uh, taxes go to pay for public art projects in that town. So the percent for art bylaw that was proposed by Eric Brody and the Amherst Public Art Commission, and Eric will join me at the table shortly, um, and that was passed by town meeting in the spring of 2017, I believe, was that a half a percent, not a full percent, just half a percent, which is within the range, these programs range from 2% to about half a percent, of the budget of all public capital construction projects, over $100,000 in town, will be used for on-site art as well as for the performing arts. The performing arts portion of this turned out to be uh, more difficult, although I think it's something valuable and worth fighting for. So the question is, can Amherst afford the percent for art bylaw? Well, town meeting thought so. I don't know if the council will think so or if the finance committee will think so, um, but I think so. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to cite some statistics for you. Uh, the Massachusetts Cultural Council this year in 2019 reported that three out of four residents participate in at least one cultural event each month here in Massachusetts. In 2019, the arts here generated $97 million in direct revenue, $880 million in indirect spending, and $2.3 billion, uh, which is kind of a wow number, maybe too much of a wow number, uh, total impact on the state as a whole as they determine. Certainly that $880 million in indirect spending, I think, is something that we as a town can try to capture in one way or another, and Percent for Art can be part of that. So the National Governors Association has come out pretty strongly in support of Percent for Art programs at the state and local level. And this is what they say in, in a recent report that they wrote. The question of how to foster high quality places is one of the most important in economic development today. By providing amenities, connectivity, and a sense of place, public art and well-designed public spaces can be part of the answer. They contribute to the visual landscape and character of a state or city. They help transform transportation corridors and waterfronts into welcoming places for people to live, work, and play, and to gather as a community. The National Assembly of State Arts Agencies has a very um, specific and detailed uh, publication on Percent for Art programs. And they talk about the ways in which these programs serve economic development, both uh, as they're um, uh, being executed by creating jobs for artists, designers, and the, and the, and the people who construct these projects. Um, and they, these projects also generate, of course, uh, they, they create, ideally, iconic works of art that draw people to your town, um, become uh, uh, they contribute to places as uh, tourist destinations. And Amherst talks a lot about becoming a two-season economy, bringing people here in the summer as well as during the year when the students are here. And the arts, of course, could potentially, um, uh, you know, contribute greatly to that. And all this is tied to what's called the creative placemaking movement. I don't have time to get too deeply into that, but um, I'm happy to talk about it more later. Uh, but the other thing to, uh, to keep in mind that the um, National Assembly of State Arts Agencies says is that these kinds of programs uh, serve social justice because they bring the arts to underserved communities, to people who don't necessarily have access to the arts. And so there's also that, that component to these kinds of programs as well. And uh, just to add, because I keep getting pushback, is that these programs are not just for big cities. Americans for the Arts reports that of 350 public art programs in the US, there are 111 that serve populations of 150,000 or less. And so, you know, Amherst is, is a bit smaller than 150,000, but one of the programs that gets singled out in some of this literature is in rural Vermont. And so we're bigger than a lot of these programs as well, places that have these programs. So it's certainly feasible. So the former finance director, when Eric was developing this, um, this bylaw, said that um, if we were to um, enact it, half a percent of art um, would cost the average Amherst taxpayer less than a cup of coffee per year. Now, Andy threw some new numbers at me, which I think are, are probably true. So let's say the elementary school project sadly is now up to $80 million, and the, town, the town's part of that is $40 million. So we take a 25-year uh, bond at 4.5% interest. Well, that only comes out to, uh, using um, Sandy's numbers, adjusted with Andy's numbers, $1.89 per year for the average taxpayer if we go out for a debt override. Now, by my own calculations, if we don't, and we take a portion of this from, let's say, property tax revenue, it's actually um, less than a percent that, that it would cost the average taxpayer per year. So we can look more specifically at numbers. And I look forward to the workbook that Sean is going to distribute, hopefully soon, so that I can play with that and plug in some numbers and really take a good, strong look at how this would affect the town and our town finances. So I want to conclude just by trying to get people excited and fired up by what public art and percent for art programs have done. And um, fire and DPW keep coming up over and over again. Why would we want to have art in a fire station or at the DPW? Well, it turns out that there are lots and lots of places uh, that do have art at their fire stations, at their DPWs, um, and uh, have executed wonderful things. So I'm going to look mostly at Cambridge and New York City only because they have the best documented programs. So it was easy, they were easiest for me to grab images from and talk about them. But this is an iconic, enormous mural, um, which you could see on the splash screen of my presentation in Inman Square in Cambridge. 
painted in 1976 for the bicentennial year, which shows, I think if you look closely, George Washington um, and Ben Franklin together with uh, the uh, fire squad there, the Inman Square Fire Station. That's really like an iconic um, work of art in Cambridge, that the, uh, the work of public art in Cambridge. Here's another project, much more recent, by Julian La Verdieri. He did the, um, the at Ground Zero, the tribute in light after the towers fell. And here he worked um, with, uh, to, to with the architects who developed a new fire station uh, in uh, Brooklyn, Engine Company 277, to come up with what he called his sentinel lantern. So he worked to develop the entire facade of the station, including these two massive um, sort of post-minimalist light fixtures encased in which on the left is the high pressure hose, on the right the fire axe, but that sort of beam out light to the street and announce to the public what it is the, these fire companies do. An artist who I knew quite well when he was alive, his uh, work was on the cover of a book I wrote, Vito Acconci, um, actually uh, is one of two artists who have now developed these amazing projects at the Newton Creek Water Treatment Plant in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. I don't know how familiar any of you are in New York. These enormous egg-shaped water treatment domes on the waterfront there. So he designed this project called Waterfall In and Out, which weaves outside and inside the visitor center of the water treatment facility, demonstrating, in a way, the ways in which these sort of buildings um, capture, treat, and then redistribute uh, this important public resource. So another image of that project as it moves into the building. And one more. And George Trakis, who actually has a work on the UMass campus, has also designed a project for the same site. This is actually along the water at the foot of the treatment plant, an entire uh, park with walkways, sculptural elements that actually bring people down to the water, out from the plant, and into the environment. Another very famous artist who's worked with environmental concerns and feminist concerns is the feminist conceptual artist Merle Laterman Eucles, who actually designed Danahy Park in Cambridge as part of their Percent for Art program. Um, so that's an old landfill that now has become, it was 15 years ago, a, a park where she designed a number of elements. She was the artist in residence at Fresh Kills in New York, which went from the world's biggest landfill now into this amazing park for Staten Island residents and, and for people all around the world. One of her many projects is building two enormous earthworks, which you see in the map on the bottom right in green, and then a viewing platform out over what had once been a landfill and is now becoming um, a, a, a beautiful park. Another project that, that she did that's become quite inspirational is to take these um, garbage trucks and uh, coat them in mirrors. This piece is called the social mirror. And it was from the 80s, long before people were worried about environmental problems, to reflect both the natural environment and the people as these trucks passed by. This project has been revived in New York and in Washington, D.C. was inspired by it. And they've started their own project painting trash trucks. Now, of course, we don't have public trash, but you could certainly imagine projects like this, school buses, DPW trucks, whatever, all could be funded potentially by Percent for Art, potentially, or some kind of public art program in Amherst. And then quickly, um, just a fun project that I like from Cambridge, this uh, hopscotch sculpture by an artist, local artist named Tori Fair. It looks like this weird spilled blob from a distance, but creates this fun play space, but using a kind of um, minimalist sculptural idiom for uh, kids in the neighborhood or anybody who ventures into Cambridge to see it and walks past the park or travels there specifically to see it. And last but not least, another project, this one from the Bronx in New York, um, Riverbank State Park. Uh, Milo Matola, who worked for Sesame Street, actually <clears throat> built this carousel on this park by commissioning local kids to do drawings and then turning them into the actual creatures that they ride on in the carousel itself. So imagine something like this, add a new DPW, why not, right? We need like, places for kids to play um, or at a school, at the elementary school. So I just, this is my, I'm done. And I think the whole, question here is one of value. Obviously, I would say we all value the arts. Everybody who ran for the council when they were asked in a questionnaire before the election said, we value the arts. But the question really is, do we as a town value the arts enough to actually pay for them? Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, why don't you uh, obviously stay where you are for a minute because I'm going to turn to questions. Just to remind everybody what happened with the Percent for Arts that was passed by town meeting. Uh, it was then, uh, so this can be done quickly, it was referred to uh, the legislature because it was a piece that needed legislative authorization. There are two things that had to happen in order for it to become an enacted bylaw under um, the rules that apply to towns as opposed to cities. The attorney general has to approve a proposed bylaw before the bylaw can become effective. And the attorney general um, held off on considering approval of the bylaw until um, the legislative um, activity was complete because the legislature's authorization for a piece of it was an essential element. Uh, the legislature consulted uh, the Department of Revenue. The Department of Revenue raised a series of questions um, about the uh, proposal and uh, in that whole thing um, it got gummed up between the DOR attorney and the Senate for completing action in the legislature and as a result it did not get past the legislature in the session which it was being considered and then the Attorney General did not act on it because they didn't feel that they had anything to act on so that the bylaw as proposed was not enacted. The Public Art Commission came uh, about a month and a half ago approximately to, um, to the council and so um, asked the council to consider um, uh, the issue yet again, um, again. and uh, so it was referred to the two committees that I mentioned including this one which is uh, what, uh, what the purpose of today's presentation is about. It's the first real discussion at this committee. Um, the, uh, it really has several different elements. One is the, the question of any financial issues that the committee may wish to raise. We also have to structure the bylaw and the bylaw, uh, one of the things that I was concerned about, the more I got to know about construction projects, uh, in how construction projects work is whether the bylaw um, as it was originally drafted actually fit within the construction project scheduling as well as I thought that it did at the time and uh, but that revisiting would be a stage if we go forward and uh, it's really the council that's going to manage that process but um, for the financial aspects of it it is before this committee. It has been referred by the council to this committee. Um, so I want to turn it back to you now to follow up. Well, I confess I'm Eric Brody, <coughs> the former chair of the Public Art Commission, 318 Strong Street. Uh, I confess I'm being a, a little uh, puzzled by why we are actually before the Finance Committee today what our objective is because we did present before the CRC, the Community Resource Committee, at, it, was at, it was then decided that a revision of the bylaw would be referred to a working group uh, to make a version of the bylaw that did not have to go through the state legislature for approval but could be approved by the town that it didn't have the special act attached to it. Um, and my understanding of the process was that <clears throat> that revision would take place. It would be then vetted by the CRC as to whether uh, they liked what they saw in terms of the terms uh, of the by, uh, uh, revised bylaw. And then it would come before the Finance Committee to determine whether the town could afford it on whatever uh, the expense might be. Uh, once it was revised. So none of that has happened yet, and so I'm not entirely sure what you want to hear from us today. Um, we are you're just urging that this process move forward. And when I heard uh, Guilford Mooring's presentation, I became even more concerned because um, 
having learned that the schematics uh, have already been done and uh, feasibility studies for the fire and um, DPW projects have already occurred, my concern is that with public art commissions, uh, the percent for art is already late for those two projects. The idea of, of an effective, uh, efficient uh, percent for art project is one that where the artist is involved from the get-go. Uh, as soon as the design uh, is, they begin to talk about design, um, an artist should be involved so that there's some concept um, being talked about from the beginning so that the art just doesn't get uh, considered as an add-on, something that's tacked on after everything else has already been decided uh, about design. So we haven't been through this before. Um, you know, to determine exactly when certain things take place, but it seems to me that we're already a little bit late uh, to the party on two of the four uh, major building projects that we're looking uh, to do here in Amherst. I'm happy to answer questions, I'm sure Bill is too, but I'm not exactly sure what you want to hear from us now. I'm gonna uh, ask the council president, since she's part of this committee also, to um, address some of what you just, see if she can answer some of your questions. Let me try to answer the two questions I've heard. The first one is um, why both committees, community resources and finance. And the reason is that when the council voted to refer this, they re voted to refer to both. One committee does not have authority over the other. Both of them are committees of the council and need to report back to the council on those items that are respectively assigned to their, their committees. So the Community Resource Committee looks at it from a standpoint of its value, if you will, right. uh, and I don't mean monetarily, but its value to the community, how it fits in with the overall vision of the community. The Finance Committee looks at it from the standpoint of finance. I understand that entirely, Lynn. Uh, my only concern was the process uh, which comes first, uh, it seemed to me that the Finance Committee would not quite know how to deal with a bylaw that it was, they didn't have before them in terms of, are we talking about half a percent now, or are we talking our caps having been added, that we have no revised bylaw for the Finance right. Committee to consider at this right. point. And being aware of this and being asked by the Community Resource Committee how they wanted to proceed, I suggested that we go ahead with our meeting today and that with some that somebody be on this working group who also represents the finance hat. Now that's pretty easy because there's a couple people on the finance committee who are also on the community resources committee. So, but I, I do not see any sense in looking at the revision of a bylaw unless we're looking at it from both the perspective of the communities and its value and its finance. So that's, it, it's really to urge that rather than go back and forth between committees, that if we're going to have a working group, it'd be a working group that represents those various perspectives. And let me just, so you don't get completely frustrated, there are gonna be a couple other levels of review before any action can take place. Anything that would relate to itself as a bylaw would also have to go to the Governance Organization and Legislative Committee okay. and for form, substance, and actionability, and in this case would also have to go to the town attorney which is a group that we retained for the review of these kinds of items. So there, that's one piece of it, okay? And, it, and it's merely to say, if we're gonna look at a rewrite of this, then let's make sure that whoever's on this committee has a, a, the representation that is brought by CRC and also the Finance Committee. I understand this, that entirely, yeah. and I have no problem with any of that. Right. Uh, and I would like to know how you see the process proceeding from here. Okay, so let me address the second question, and no, you're not too late to the party. Those, those feasibility studies that were done are, one is three years old, one is two years old, and they could not go anywhere. They were dead in the water until we had actual uh, sites, and we are, only in the, uh, we are only in the process right now of exploring a site for DPW based on the Amherst College, very generous offer to explore the site off of Southeast Street. Um, and if we move, as we move forward, once we have those sites, you really, as, as 
uh, Guilford's pointed out, feasibility studies are only 10 to 30 percent of what you need to be able to talk about what is a building really. And so while percent for art wasn't in those, neither was net zero. And so, but yet you look at, for instance, the Fort River study that was recently done or the work that's been done in the library, and both of those studies have actually brought in energy saving uh, viewpoints and expertise into the design. So there's a lot more to be done on any of this. The, the train has not left any station left yet, and the voters still have a lot to say about it. I'm glad so, you that. <laughs> that's, that is really where we stand on that. But going back to your first point, I think we should proceed with any questions from a financial st standpoint today, and then I think we should proceed with a working group that's going to look at the energy, but at the, um, uh, at the uh, percent for art. Okay. Who has the authority to call the working group, and when might that happen? I would expect, I would expect that CRC and uh, finance would come forward to the council. We would form the working group. So it would be a vote of the whole council to, to start the working group on this. Generally, that's how we would go forward. We haven't formed any, well, that's not true. We have, we've formed a number of, we formed a committee, but we've not formed working groups. Since it would not be a working group of one single committee, it would have to be a working group of the council. Part of the problem, of course, is that uh, work groups were put into rules of procedure with that blank and place, we're and we're not there yet because it was referred back to, I believe, GOL to yep. uh, yes. come back to us for a proposal on flushing out what's really a blank section of the council rules of procedure. Uh, so we're in the process, but I think that the council always has the authority to create a work group without it being in the rules of uh, procedure. By the way, otherwise known as ad hoc committees. Yes. Which okay. we always have the authority. Kathy. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, the, actually it's, it was, it's a sentence in the rules rather than a, and it was a paragraph, but it can be formed and the idea is that it wouldn't be just council members. You know that it would be a real working group to work out things, so it could be cross committee. And Lynn, I do think we we were meeting. The GOL group has asked me to come to explain why. Particularly, I love the idea of work groups, as did Shalini on the rules committee, to when we were writing this, because I think they're a flexible vehicle to just hash out whatever the questions are and come back with proposals. So I think we do need to get one in it in motion rather than just in concept. That, that was, in fact, a discussion last night when we had the first reading of the changes to the rules of procedure. Uh, that The first time that would come back to the council is August 19th, for that matter. The first time anything's going to come back to the council is August 19th, since we don't meet again till then. Uh, but the reality is that we can form an ad hoc committee anytime. That's already provided for. So when might that happen? We can try to put it on the August 15, 19th agenda, but I will tell you it's already a very unusual meeting. If you ever want to see a strange council meeting, come to the one where we walk in the door, we receive copies of all of what we've written for the town manager's evaluation, and we sit here in front of the TV, and they watch us read for, and at 6.30, we will take up business for one hour, and then go back to reading and discussing, so. Yeah, um, yeah I don't think, that, I, I think that today, I'm gonna get back to today, was important because it was referred to our committee as well as CRC. This committee has not has got had a referral of a proposal, but has not um, had a presentation about or discussion about the proposal. And um, I appreciate Eric that you were at our last meeting and couldn't do it. I wanted to get um, that introduction for this committee done. I felt that that was important that we get it started um, so that people could begin to understand what this was about and ask initial questions. 
And um, I thank you very much for doing that because it, I think it is helpful to get this committee involved. Otherwise, it was sort of a referral with a blank and you helped fill in the blank. And so I um, appreciate it. And I'm gonna to turn to the committee now for a few minutes for questions and then I wanna, uh, we're gonna to have to um, then uh, get a couple minutes of public comment and I wanted to have time for Sean, he has, uh, he has an important presentation. Also to make for us, uh, Dorothy, you see, uh, Dorothy, you see. Yeah. Um, I, I am I understand your frustration, but we have been so busy, we haven't had a chance to really do much. Now, Andy wrote a long list of questions and things that he thought we should consider. We haven't really had the space in which to talk about them. And I put together some ideas today, um, and they're kind of half CRC and half finance committee. Because question one is, why should the taxpayers of Amherst pay for art? And I have a few thoughts, I'll give you a copy afterwards, but, uh, and some of these are things that you would agree with, and some of them are things that you might not agree with, which we have to discuss in great detail, because Andy has said, and I did check the minutes, that he thought we needed to rewrite the bylaw. So that has not happened, and the working group would probably do that. But um, I'm just gonna read to you, uh, public art reflects our values, uh, New England culture and history, spiritual, intellectual, physical life, nature, transcendentalism, originality and creativity. There are few works of public art in Amherst, uh, few statues of significant people or commemorating events. There is a steel sculpture of Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost. There are some statues on the Amherst College campus. Uh, there's the Amherst College War Memorial. There's some Tiffany windows. Uh, there is no child-friendly art, uh, except for a little bronze pony in the Wildwood Cemetery, which is delightful. So that when I take people around Amherst, we go to only a few places to look at things that reflect Amherst. We don't even exhibit our Civil War stones, which I find upsetting. Um, so a walker in Amherst does not see our history and culture. And I think that's very important that they do that. But I have some limitations that I'm suggesting. I, I think that this is also a way, we're gonna to spend tons of money on designers, builders, contractors, and I think we should also provide work for artists, but I want them to be local Western Mass artists. Um, I put down, I thought, well, how much money, since so much money is gonna go on the, the, the administration, the, the maintenance, the supervision, I'm thinking, what's left over for the artist? And I thought, well, maybe half a year's salary or a year's salary, something that would reflect that. Maybe it's only as small as thirty or seventy thousand dollars, but it's for the time and the effort, um, because this is the people of Amherst are paying for this art, it, not rich donors. So it's um, therefore I also think it's important that it express the values of the workers at the sites as well as of the artists. The people at the at the sites must accept and be happy with the art. Um, and I think I looked at your bylaw again. Some works of art might not have to be exactly that are connected with a public building, might not have to be exactly at the site. For example, a brief discussion with Lynn today, DPW, um, perhaps the art could be in the area around DPW uh, for the benefit of the uh, community, which is nearby. Also, uh, this is part of education and delight for the public, so I hope that the artist this is not in your thing, would be available for some talks in schools and would be involved in, or maybe your committee would be doing the booklet of, of uh, artwork in the town. But I just wanted to say I support the idea. Uh, we have a lot of questions as to how the financing fits with this challenge we have, which is leading into the device of how are we going to afford these buildings. But I think Lynn is right, there's still time to do it. And I think Amherst, needs this. Thank you. Yes, Kathy. Um, I agree with what Dorothy just said and knowing this was coming up, started doing clippings and uh, one was a Norwegian city that no one ever visited because every building is gray because what they use is gray stone that they have and it's now a major tourist mecca because what they did is so beautiful and one of their ugliest buildings, the town council proposed to tear it down and everyone rose up and said, no, 
because of the art that was on the side. They didn't want it, they liked it. So I think this notion that it's economic development, it's not just pretty. Um, you did some in New York, but some of the New York sites uh, relive what New York history is um, and social justice. When I walked the streets of Melbourne, uh, we don't often celebrate this, but there were women, women statues of women suffragists fighting for workers' rights, and Melbourne was built by prisoners. But uh, when there was a workers' right issue, they actually have a statue of the stonemason who put down his sledge, saying he wouldn't build anymore until they did such and such. They have a statue celebrating a minimum wage strike where people, and so tourists go around and get a history of the town. That's how I knew these. I just followed this woman around. It was really very exciting. So I think we should think of this as exciting, um, not just a pretty picture. So but the other thing I wanted to just say is I think, Lynn, there's a way of moving forward more quickly than just waiting for the 19th, although we might have to do it formally. But I'd be willing to be, if we want to say someone from finance should be on a work group, I'd be willing to be on it to do whatever, if we need to do fine tuning of the wording, you know, so maybe we can get who on CRC, and it's just a small group that gathers up the questions and then brings something back, so it doesn't have a feeling of just us all thinking about, but, but a little bit more of a feeling of action. Shall we? just want to build on what uh, Kathy and Dorothy said. I, I feel it's a challenge only if we look at the cost side and don't look at the, the value and revenues that this could drive. In particular, I found it really interesting to see that um, in terms of tourism, art uh, attracts tourist revenue. And I thought it was really interesting that American cultural travelers spend on average 60% more than other types of travelers, and they take more trips. And so if we can integrate this together with our eco, tourist, um, educational, you know, make it a more comprehensive, and I'm sure that's what I'm hearing, is how to make it a comprehensive strategy that weaves in uh, our values, our culture, our history, and tie it into all of that, and then it's really, um, providing benefit at so many different levels. And I just want to say the other part of uh, financial aspect is I read it art enhances property values. Mm -hmm. So that's another angle to look at. Uh, it attracts business businesses and uh, it, it gives jobs to people. So again, I would be in favor of first supporting the local artists. Looking around to see if there's anybody else from the committee. Uh, any other comments from our two representatives? From I would just add to what Dorothy Art. said that, that we also have, in addition to the public artworks you mentioned, a number of murals uh, scattered around town, including that enormous history mural that's now being repainted uh, behind One East Pleasant Street. So there's, there's more. You're correct that we don't have an enormous amount of public art, but what we do have now is an opportunity for some really iconic pieces that we couldn't possibly afford otherwise, uh, that we can, uh, because of the percent for our program, um, contribute to Amherst Streetscape. Can you around you, Shelley, then we really do need to move on. Uh, a question about costs, like uh, in terms of, is there a guarantee from the artists of how long these structures are supposed to last and their maintenance costs? So that will be part of the project development, but certainly we would expect that these would last a lifetime of the building. I mean, that's, that's the way these projects are designed. Anything else now? Okay. Um, so I thank you um, very much. And I think that um, I need to ask Sean how your timing, do I need, I, I assume we need to get to you now, uh, now or um, I don't know if there's anybody with public comment who might want just a couple of minutes. Okay, 
Why don't you, you need to come up to the microphone. You need to introduce yourself and uh, make sure that. Uh, we need to go later only because of the difficulty of calling another meeting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So. Shoshona King, 46 Rolling Green Drive in Amherst. The experience economy is here. How will Amherst evolve to meet this? Arts and culture are catalysts for creative economic development, and with the utilization of the Percent for Art program, Amherst may embed opportunities for quality of life and economic development that a robust arts, culture, and creative sector can bring. According to a survey conducted by the Joint Legislative Committee on Cultural Affairs, 99% of the chief executive officers in industry stated that the availability of a healthy cultural climate in an area is an important consideration in choosing a new location. The Travel Industry Association of America's Findings in the National Travel Survey showed that 65% of American adult travelers say that in the past year that they had included a cultural arts heritage or historic activity or event while they are on a trip of 50 miles or more. This equates to 92.7 million cultural travelers. Of those 92.7 million travelers, 32% of those, which means 29.6 million travelers, added extra time to their trip because of a cultural, art, heritage, or historic event or activity. Scrolling, scrolling. Other cultural activities enjoyed are live theater, art galleries, heritage or ethnic festivities, musical performances, by engaging in public arts as, art as a tool for growth and sustainability, communities can thrive economically. 70% of Americans believe that the arts improve the image and identity of their community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, can, can um, you make sure we get your first and last name, just write it on a piece of paper so I can get it in a minute. Okay. Um, Thanks. I heard it, but I'll spell it wrong if I don't get it written down. I'll submit it to you, or you can just. I have one other comment. Yeah, uh, Lynn. Yeah, I, not to belabor this, but I've actually gone back and checked both our charter and our rules of procedure. The council has to establish any ad hoc committee. At that point, I can appoint people to a committee. Uh, generally, that talks about committees of the council, but I also know that we have had committees that include other than that. So unfortunately, we can't do anything until we meet again on the 19th. I would suggest that we try to come up with a charge for that ad hoc committee by that time. Um, maybe Kathy and others are willing to work on that and bring it forward, okay? So, Sean, I think you know most of the people here. I think. Hello, Sean uh, Mangano, Director of Finance for the Schools and helping out Town Capital, uh, the tool. Um, I might need Sonia to tell me where to put this. Things have changed up here. There used to be a huge TV monitor, and now it's gone. Yeah, we decided we wanted to see you. It went from like really big to really small. So it's, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wrong one. Okay, so this is version 1.2. Uh, we I presented 1.1 to you all, and um, I think the overarching feedback was make it simpler. So as I go through this, you'll see that it's much simpler. Um, there's a few more pieces of feedback that I recently got from both Sonia and the town manager that I still have to implement, and I'll point out what those things are. Um, but my hope is to go through this today, get your feedback, 
um, incorporate that feedback, and then send it out to you all within a couple days to play around with it some more. Just a little historic, since there are two mm -hmm. people who were on previous finance committees, and I know at least one, if not both of you, were sitting in the room when Sandy Poehler showed us his first version. This is Sandy Poehler on steroids, mm -hmm. just to be clear. Well, it's, almost, it's almost the opposite. It's almost like, I don't know, whatever the opposite of steroids are. It's <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, that's the version, instructions. So there's fewer instructions. Um, fully read the instructions, review the glossary of terms, um, and then go to the simulation tab. Um, and then there's, as you'll see when we get there, there's a number of prompts that you sort of address, and then you can look at the charts and see what happens. The glossary has changed a little bit. Um, some of the terms we pulled out because when we simplified the sheet, some of the, the terms went away. Um, we changed net zero premium to net zero cost to try to uh, steer away from the, pre the term premium. Um, but we can add more to this glossary as you go through it. If you see the terms that maybe I missed, we can add to this. And so this is really most of it. So there's a number of questions here um, or uh, prompts and I'm gonna go through each one and just show you the different responses and there's a number of variables. We can't go through all the different variables today but that's the point of the tool. Um, and then I'll get your feedback and, and uh, adjust it accordingly. So the first one is use the drop down boxes to select the projects you want to model, uh, the cost of each project and the start date of, of construction. In addition, check the boxes for projects to be funded by existing capital funds, uncheck the box for projects funded by debt exclusion override. So one piece of feedback I already received was these boxes are really little. So I'm gonna work on fixing that, making these um, uh, check boxes bigger and maybe doing the opposite, um, checking it if you want it to be debt exclusion versus unchecking it. So you've got your different projects over here, library, fire station, uh, DPW, the new 600 student school, Fort River and Wildwood. And next to each of those, you can put in different amounts. Um, another piece of feedback I already have is to put more options for amounts um, and have zero be an option and just more uh, range of numbers to choose from. Uh, but for right now, for the library, for example, there's 25 million, 30 million, and 35.6. Um, but we'll add more options. Is there 15? <laughs> we'll get there when we add more options, yeah. <laughs> Um, the grant is already, so the grant for both the library and the school is already factored in here. It's not an assumption anymore to play around with. It's, it's factored in based on, this is total project cost, um, and the grant funds will be applied automatically. Uh, you can change the starting construction year. Again, I can add more options, but this is between 2023 and 2027. Um, and then this is the little box to check, which we need to make bigger. But you check it, uncheck it, and it makes it either debt exclusion or come from existing capital funds um, available to the town. So fire station, same thing. There's three options right now. We'll add more, um, and so on and so on. For the schools, one of the pieces of feedback that is a little bit more of a, a bigger change I have to work on is trying to make it an either or. So instead of you being able to um, accidentally put in amounts for all three schools and have that projected out, which isn't really a realistic option, um, making it an either or. So if you did the 600 student school, then you wouldn't be able to do the Fort River and Wildwood and vice versa. Um, but this, again, just allows you to pick all the amounts that you want. Um, right now, if you wanted to do this, you would just click the NA if you didn't want to do that option. But we'll do the 600 student school and we'll do NA for these two. So what this is saying right now is these are the amounts we're projecting for these projects. These are the fiscal years. And again, this is just hypothetical right now. Um, and that we want to fund all the projects um, out of existing capital funds. So right now there's no debt exclusions factored in. Um, then you choose an estimated borrowing rate. So between three and 5%, um, I'll keep it at five. You can choose an estimated um, net zero cost. So this is added on to whatever the, the base construction cost would be. Um, this goes from zero up to 10%. I'll leave it at five. Um, cost escalation factor, so depending on what year you pick for a starting year, um, the cost escalation will compound as you go forward. So I'll do 4% for that. And how much will be allocated towards other capital needs in town? So um, 2.5 million is about half of what's currently allocated towards capital needs in town. Um, you could leave it 
almost closer to what we currently spend on capital needs in town, but I'll leave it, I'll put it at three million for now. And so once you answer those prompts, um, you scroll down and you can look at the charts that we've seen before. So this chart shows a few different things. The first uh, most important thing is this line. This is how much is available um, from our existing funds for capital. So this is the 10% of the tax levy um, projected forward. So if it's over this line, it means it goes beyond our current capacity to pay from existing funds. This green bar is our existing debt, which is projected to run out over the next few years. This yellow bar is the ongoing capital. So if I chose um, five million instead of three million, you'll see that line get that bar get a lot bigger. So obviously less available for other capital, um, but I'll put it back for now. And then all the other bars are related to the projects. So um, fire is red, DPW is gray, library is purple, and the new 600 student school is orange. So those represent the um, annual premium and interest payments in that year. Um, so they stack on top of each other so you can see can we afford all these capital needs or not. Um, if I say we're gonna do a debt exclusion for the library and the school, then you'll see those two come out because those will now come from a different source of funds and it looks much more doable in terms of what, can be, what we can afford. Um, and this little chart down here shows you how much above um, the 10% levy line these um, debt payments are. So in aggregate, um, for all the years that it, the, the debt payments exceed this line, um, it's 16 million over. And this chart we modified a little bit um, just to look at the outstanding debt. So this just really totals the outstanding debt um, from these new projects. Um, so at its peak, we hit about 115 million somewhere in there. And then as we pay it off, it would go down. And then the debt impact from the debt exclusion. So there's sort of two peaks here because we had two projects, the library and the school. So the first debt exclusion is based on the year that you pick. Um, that's would be the average impact on a $322,000 property, which is the median. We changed this from the last time. It was, I think, the average household last time. We changed it to the median household. So it went down a little bit in terms of the property value. Um, but this is, would be the average impact from the first project that's debt excluded. And then when the second project's debt excluded, it would spike up again and then come down over the life of the project, um, if that's how the debt payments are set up for that project. And there's a little summary explanation under each of these that sort of gives more information on each of these charts. So if, just so you can see how it works, if I, un, if I recheck these and said we're not gonna do a debt exclusion for any of the projects, then this goes to zero because there would be no additional um, taxes. But we can't do it because we can't afford it. Well, you can't do it because you can't afford it. <laughs> so, um, so again, it's, there's lots of different variables for you to play around with and, and see what, um, what is produced. I've got a couple, like I said, a few more things to fix um, or update to maybe streamline the options even more um, and give more choices for, for dollar amounts. Um, but I'm open to your feedback and if there's other information you think we should have the show or organize it differently, whatever you think. I'm gonna ask one and then I'm gonna ask Kathy since she had her hand up. Uh, um, I saw it uh, and go around the room. Um, the question of uh, the 5% borrowing cap, uh, is, that, is that a line that, did I miss that? So, I'm sorry, say that again? The, the question of the, this, the borrowing cap. That's, that's uh, that, we took it out of here because with the school projects, before there was a debt ceiling line in here, but with the financial advisor telling us that the school projects are outside of that, it sort of made that, we weren't as close to that as we were before. Um, so we've, we've removed that from here. Okay. So this includes, this debt here includes all the debt from all the projects, but it's not, it's not a debt ceiling sort of comparison. Okay. It's just looking at the outstanding debt from these projects. Okay, for our new members, if you have a question about that question, <laughs> ask me afterwards. Kathy. Can, thank you for the extra work you put into this. Um, just out of curiosity, can you change your 5% interest to 3%? And then move, 
and then move down. And so this is one of the things he's added since last time, you know, on whether if we went out to the market now, you can be at that rate and to what extent it affects it. So we're able to change start dates now and you've limited the extent to which we can try to build a school for a dollar, right? Yep. You know, yeah, got, now you have got, either a range, you know, so this is more a tool to inform. So um, I guess my, my main question on the additional things you want to do with this, you're showing the impact um, on a median household if we do it at exclusion. I know I'm going to be asked, but my home is $500,000 yeah. or my home is $200,000. So if there could be a really simple way mm -hmm. of going from one to the other without you giving us a lot more numbers, that would just mm -hmm. be great. Yeah, no, that's actually another um, piece of feedback the town manager gave was that there's a way maybe down here to put a little field where um, somebody can type in their property value and then have it calculate their specific um, so that'll be another piece that will Yeah, because I don't think you want to, you know, I like the cleanness of this. Mm -hmm. um, and my, uh, you know, I'm, you see I'm craning my head to go around, but when I uh, did a district meeting with the earlier version of this, which hasn't changed that much, right. I converted a couple of these pictures to PowerPoint and made the font really big <laughs> because you can't see it. Yeah. Um, you know, and so unless you have a huge video screen, you know, the line made total sense to people. They understood being above the line means yep. Yep. we can't, we don't have the money to spend, right. you know. Um, so you're just trying to think of font size when you come back. So even the label on this, it's too small. You've got plenty of room in that picture mm -hmm. to make the font size sure. bigger. Yep. Yeah, I can do that. You know, I used to have a, a rule when I did presentations, no smaller than X if I want someone three rows back to be able to read right. it. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, did you have a question, Bob? Yeah, I, I'm a little bit new to this, but it seems to me that it would be helpful to have a wider range of start dates mm -hmm. so we could see what happens if we stretch some of these projects out over time. Sure. Yeah, I can make it. I can make it go, whatever you guys think, I can make it go out, you know, 10 years, you know, starting with 2022 or something like you, that. You didn't limit it last time. Is it limited now? It's limited now. Yeah, it has the limited options for, okay. um, right now, I think it's five years. Because I, I did exactly that. I said, suppose I stretch them out over 15 years, um, you know, just really stretch them yeah, out. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. just to see, sure. you know, what the impact is, and it may not be realistic, but it might give us some better insights yeah. as to what options are available. Yep. Yeah, that's no problem to do that. And the start date on years um, then inflates the construction cost to the yep. assumption that's made. Um, I know that Mary Lou had her hand up. I was just trying to make sure that you had gotten your question answered. Okay, Mary Lou, thank you. I can't see this as clearly as <laughs> I would like to, but do we have the number of bond years? We. The old one had 20 years, 25, and 30. Yeah, so this assumes 30. We could make that an option, make it 20 to 25 or 30. We could have three options if you want to do that. Well, I, th I think at least 25 might be okay. helpful. I, I'm not sure we could do all the projects on a 20-year bond. Okay. Yeah, I can add that. Yeah, I think that the one of the things we've been thinking about is um, to what extent do we want to make this available to the public at large so that um, members of the public can um, look at it and see for themselves as to how choices affect them and um, the uh, more choices you put in, the more complicated it gets for that purpose. Um, and so you sort of get this toss up between the value to us and the committees and the council and the general public that would not have our level of involvement with it necessarily. Um, and that was one of the struggles that we think we've been working with. Um, Lynn, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, let me just go to an example sure. project, okay? Go to the library, which is where you are. Uh, right now, um, with the library funding statewide, 
it's about a $32 million project, okay? And they may know as early as July 1st, 2020, that they're going to get their money, at which point they have six months to have the town uh, basically decide, are we going forward? Mm -hmm. And so the town portion at that point becomes a minimum of 15.9 million, plus actually, interestingly enough, a guarantee on close to another six million. Right. And so the 225 would be the construction year, right? Yeah, I mean, I put that out, but I think, right now I think planned construction was 2022 or 2023, somewhere in there. But yeah, okay. that's, that would be the construction year. Okay, so that's an example, mm -hmm. okay, how you can go through and refine this and look at it and so forth. The other place, I know when I played with the model, the previous one, I played with front-loading some of the sidewalk uh, road stuff, in other words, the other capital me needs, mm -hmm. the vehicle stuff, et cetera, and reducing, obviously, the price of some of these things, but then slacking off on a couple of the regular ongoing sure. um, items, which doesn't make you popular, but you're not gonna be popular either way here, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so it allowed you, though, to get yourself a little more under the mm -hmm. line um, in the model that we had in the past. And I'm not clear that I see the ability to shrink that um, up above for the gold part. Yeah, I mean, the way it's shown here now is just if you're under the line, you can assume that there's room to spend more. Um, but if you wanted it to be like phase, like how much we're gonna spend on ongoing capital for the next 10 years and have a certain amount, and then the next 10 years after that have a different amount, um, we could have a separate field for that, um, but it might make it more complicated, but it's. The other thing is just to go back to the library because I, I'm not for, I'm not forecasting where I stand on this, but go back to the library and that is they have given us a figure that if they don't tear down and rebuild the addition that renovations would be somewhere around 10 million. Sure. So I want to make sure that that number is in there as well. Yeah, I think that's the, and I, I seek your guidance on this. I mean, the hard part with both the school project and the library project is the timing because this is going to let you plug in variables and see the cost, but they're not always going to line up with what we actually have to do, either the requirements of the grants um, or the requirements of, like you said, the town voting its portion, um, or the library being flexible, what's new construction versus what's just, you know, those renovation needs of the library. I don't know if that would be considered new in construction this, or if that would just come out of ongoing capital. No, at that I think point. in this case we would probably be saying, okay, here is a huge package of, money, of yeah. renovation. And that would be about ten million. So we could me I'm gonna work on this um, tonight and tomorrow, sort of like the schools, um, where it's an either or yep. with um, yep. either the six hundred student school or the Fort River Wildwood. We could have something with the library which is you know, if it says zero for the, a new library, then it prompts a number for renovations. And you need to do that because you've got the grant built in to 35000 and otherwise you can't do what Lynn's suggesting. Say, just plug in the number 10, right? No, yeah, you can't do it right now because you only yep. have these options. You have to, there, there's You know, no like the handle. school gets 50% of a grant thing, so he, he's got that, he's not a lot. The old one allowed me to yeah, well, choose the, how to do that, yeah. but, the but this is not allowing was that. To, yeah. Was to try to limit that sure. piece. Yeah, but you're, you're right. Right now you couldn't do that, so I'd have to build that in, but it, the, that can be done. Interestingly enough, the, <laughs> at this point, the library, we have some of the firmer numbers on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I mean, the grant that they are in queue for and number two on the list is uh, the grant itself would be about 13 million something. Mm -hmm. And the, so it, we're starting to hone in on that firmness. And another piece of this I'd have, we'd have to probably talk to um, the library director about this is, you know, if you scale down this project from what's sort of the approved budget or the, right. does, is the grant still available at that point? Um, this may be one of the ones where maybe we don't want options, maybe it's, either 
the option that's out there or it's the renovation. Or but maybe you do what you did with the schools and you either have an either. Either or, or. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I would suggest just adding another row under library of one is library, new library renovation. Renovated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I can do that. Just a comment or another suggestion. I think it, where there is like the line, where there where there is a limit, I think there should be a label on the mm -hmm. graph of this is a line we can't cross or okay. something to that effect. You know, something more Alarming. that grabs your attention. More Again, than, yeah. for the public, you know, for people who aren't um, versed in this, it would just his, be a, a you know his very first version. But he has the cumulative how much we're too high. But he used to have this exploding red star <laughs> with a big number in it. Like, you just, you're 25 million in debt here. <laughs> yeah, we can bring you know, that it was back. Like, <laughs> and, and could you go back to the lowest one where you look at people's, the impact on people's tax rate? Do you want me to have it show something? Yeah. So now we've had a debt exclusion override, which means you're, you're paying more taxes than you presently pay. Mm -hmm. Can we have like maybe three or four lines if your house was 250, your house was 350 mm -hmm. or whatever? Yeah, I mean, we could do that. We, that, that was how it was originally. Um, the other thing I could do with this chart, I don't know if, if, if you like the 322, I could, or, or not, I could just have this chart have it be a question up above, choose the value of your home, mm -hmm. and then this chart would just be based on that. Um, and we could just have a note that says if you want to see the median or the, the median income, it's put in 322, but if you want to see your own home value, yeah. choose your own. And then this chart would just reflect that. Um, okay. And I'll just, yeah, I'll fix the titles of it. And used to be an amazing piece of work, Sean. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Jeff, you okay, I, just, I had one other question on what you've built on the design. If I, do, if I don't choose the 600-person school, but I choose the two schools, mm -hmm. do you make me choose construction dates that are farther apart? Mm -hmm. Like I can't say I'm going to do them both in one year or... You could. And have you built in a grant assumption? Yeah, so the grant assumption for this is um, one of them gets... Um, one of them has the MSBA grant, the other one does not. Okay, so right now it's one does and one doesn't, so you're no longer allowing me to have both with a grant, but I'm waiting yeah. eight years for grant two. Yeah, it's a good point if you choose a wider span of time. So I'm, I, I'm just asking them what I can and can't do with this, because we will get some yeah, questions. Yeah, well, it's, it's a good point to clarify whatever, however I adjust it, to maybe allow you to do the MSBA for both if you span the time enough. Because you're right, okay. if you did 10 years apart, then it's possible you could do MSBA for both. Um, but if you tried doing both near each other, then would not. Okay. Okay, so the solid line that uh, sets the limit is based on 10%, and that's not a changeable number? Currently, it's not. I thought about it, and we can, because one of the pieces of the feedback was, can we make it 11% or 10.5%? So it could be a changeable number if we want it to be. And when we were talking about that, is that would we do it just for, like for four years, we'd go up, right. knowing that that means on the operating budget side, yeah, exactly. everyone yeah. is getting very thin. Sonia would like to chime in. Yeah, not to put out any doom or gloom or anything out there, but there's always the possibility that that 10% would need to go down yeah. for future budgets. Well, that actually was why I was putting the 10%, asking this 10% question, because you and I have lived through operating budgets under those scenarios where we had to reduce the number quite a bit. And I had, us yeah. too. And I had three uh, residents say lines don't always go up. When yeah, that's we the other first thing. did this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. um, because we really don't know. The other thing is, is that I thought about as I looked at it, aside from that question as to the inflexibility of the 10%, gets back to a question that we talked about with the prior presentation on percent for art. Uh, 
I don't know if you've done any thinking about that, but if we, um, as a community, uh, adopt percent for art uh, as it's been previously proposed at a half percent, and don't include it in any way to is an option which you're either doing you're then saying that it has to come out of other things that you're proposing to put into the project that you're going to cut a half a percent of other things out of a project we are already maneuvering to try and as we heard from Guilford um, be value conscious in decisions and make appropriate decisions so I don't know how if there's any way, um, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's just a topic we have to set aside from this process, but I thought I'd at least ask. Yeah. Um, at one point, I think we had it in here and we took it out because of the uncertainty around it, or at least at that time. Um, so it's some something we could put back in as an, an, an additional cost, sort of like the estimated net zero cost, it could be a, a field for that. Um, that's more known, I think it's a fixed amount, right? The, the half the percent. The so, bylaw, yeah. yeah, the bylaw for net zero allows you to go up to 10%. Right. But the, uh, it, it could just be something in a fixed factor, but I think seeing it in there. Would it be useful to have a chart like this that showed the cost of it? No. Yeah, we can certainly add into the, to the the um, pre the cost of the projects, would it be helpful to see sort of what the total amount was as depicted in the chart? Um, I I'm not sure how it works. Is it, a up, is it a lump sum up front based on the project cost or would it be based on the annual payments? Or is that decided yet? That's one of the unknowns about the bylaw. Okay. Is how is it calculated? Mm -hmm. And are we, is it part of the original borrowing with the purpose, some people feel that's the only way you can do it. Some people feel that it's by, you know, value engineering your project and therefore you can squeeze the money out. Mm -hmm. And some people feel like it should just come from another pot. So it's, I've heard at least those three options. Okay. Well, it's definitely something we could add to this when it's more uh, defined. But for now, I can add that piece up above if, if you want to add that in. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a question I have is whether the benefits of the net zero construction in terms of operational costs yeah. are built in as well. No, um, they're not. And we did, I mean, and I can make this more expansive on the glossary we did try to be clear that this is the additional upfront cost to make the building completely self right i understand i don't yeah. understand it would complicate it yeah but, i mean in effect we are going to get a savings presumably mm -hmm. by going net zero in in your operational budget yes. and yeah. it's an interesting thing i mean at one point i had actually hoped that maybe we could create a fund within the town, the town the city of Worcester has done this, but it's a fund within the town that you borrow against to do the net zero pieces and then the savings, if you will, it's like um, an accounting issue, but the savings basically go back to fund the fund. But we have not done that thus far. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I might come back to that, sir, in a minute, but Sharon, you had something? I just wanted to throw out, um, like, I feel like the more this um, committee talks about fine-tuning this, the less understandable um, and, the, and the less uh, useful it's going to be for the average citizen. I think basically uh, someone wants to be able to go on here, understand how to put in the price of their home and figure out how much it's going to affect their taxes. I mean, that's the bottom line. I think there's going to be also a subset of people that really want to get into the minutia of maneuvering the different um, fields around, and, and this committee certainly wants to be able to do that. So I don't know whether it makes sense to have um, like a, a, a very useful tool for us and mm -hmm. then, you know, something that's 
that, that's more um, what you were trying to do by simplifying it. Those yeah, and I think that's, I think you're right. There's, there's this, and then there's like the version before this that um, is just more staff working with the council to actually project out um, the costs. Yeah, but I, I even think some of the suggestions that we've thrown out here are going to make it less um, right. obvious for people. Yeah. Just really, just get in there really quick and do it. Okay. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, we can debate. Along those lines, do you think this chart is informative to people? I mean, this again, this is more, I don't know if the average citizen would care about this chart. It takes up space. If you think it's useful, we can leave it in there. I'm not sure anymore exactly what the value is of it anymore, but um, if you think there's a, a purpose for it, we can leave it in, or if, we, if there's a maybe a slightly different purpose, we can tweak it, but I was thinking this might be one we w might want to pull out and just focus on the, the tax rate um, impact, and then also can we afford it with our existing capital funds? If we're talking about people in the public, um, I think it's nice for them to see that the debt goes down, mm -hmm. instead of, so it's not like the U.S. debt. Right. There you go. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I guess my suggestion would be, perhaps if you're going to keep it in, to have that be the bottom, like have the have be the, the last one. Part, yeah. You know, be the the input section, and then the very next you know slide perhaps is can we afford it, mm -hmm. and then the next the slide one. is hey, what does it mean for me? Okay, that's a good idea. Give me a clue. And I just, um, I... Wait, Mary Lou is uh, had the... Would it, <clears throat> would it be possible to have a simple chart for the public that they can understand and it's more um, uh, complicated, as it were, a uh, chart for people like the finance committee, the counselors, and so forth. I think something really streamlined for the public, but they could also then, it could be online if they want to do more. Mm -hmm. But I think something very basic would be the best thing for them. Sure. I, I'd like to build on that. I think that ultimately, if, especially at the point at which we go out for a debt exclusion override, the question in everybody's going to mind is, what does it mean for me? And by that point, we'll know what the costs are. So there's a point at which we freeze the picture. Mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of playing with, what does it mean for me as a taxpayer? in terms of my property tax. Yeah, I mean, as a planning tool, we will consider in the council level with the assistance of the committee, the decisions about how much to build um, and when to build. But um, it, so the interactive, some of the interactive pieces are very important for those decisions. When it gets around to the question of public support, it does narrow down. Uh, my one comment about net zero, by the way, just so, uh, is that it's actually a fairly complicated question because if you read the bylaw, there's a piece that has to do with building buildings that are net zero ready which means that they have all of the insulation and structural pieces in place that will allow for um, net zero to be effectively added to the building, and then the additional pieces, the cost of the solar panels. And uh, there are actually two different parts in the bylaw, not one, one, not one single part. Um, and. Uh, I don't think that we can deal with that today and nor as part of this process, but I think as a committee, we just have to keep remembering okay. that it isn't quite that simple. Yeah, and the cost of solar panels, if you buy them versus lease them, can be a huge range, so. Yeah. Uh, and the question of the effect on operating costs um, is out there, too. <clears throat> the the uh, other thing that, uh, I keep trying to figure out how to get people to understand is, is that the more of debt that you charge against existing 10% limit, uh, the chart that you're currently looking at, uh, uh, in order to make it work, then you have to shrink down the part that's the um, ongoing capital 
which is where they get their road repairs done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, uh, that in reality is a variable factor for community to consider, but I think we're freezing it in as, uh, as I understand what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's building in a fixed amount, so um, the road repairs would come out of this, and this grows a little bit. There's some growth attached to the 2.5%. It grows with the levy, just like the 10% the line, but um, yeah, the roads would have to come out of that chunk. Yeah. I, that's what I was going to add when I unfortunately cut someone off. Um, when I did some, a presentation with this a uh, month or so ago, I froze a few scenarios and just talked to people, including the think out 20 year, or 15 years what happens. But I included a slide uh, that states what Andy is saying. This is how much money we have each year, and this is what we've been spending. Right. Um, to anchor it in uh, a million for roads, you know, something that people would understand so that are we choosing two and a half million or three and a half million for your green bar, your yellow bar? Um, anytime we go anywhere near two and a half million, we're spending less than we're spending now, considerably, considerably less, less yeah. um, for the repair of building because it, it, was, it was very useful to have done that. On, on what is that imaginary number, mm -hmm. everything else is still ongoing. Um, it's not. Yeah. So I, I think we can, we can have a tool, but we can have a couple introductory uh, definitive things that says this is the reality of Amherst, and then this is showing you what we at if we try to build all these buildings. Yeah. yeah, and I can try to add some sort of notation here, or maybe on the glossary that gives a context of what we currently spend. So people know when they're choosing three million, what the impact of that is, that it's not just choosing a smaller right. amount. And I'm just thinking when you very first came on with this, you actually did something very clever because you are very sure. clever. But you had a couple stylized PowerPoint charts mm -hmm. and then you suddenly were in the model. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was something outside of that which just gave you some facts and then you were right. flipping through the scenarios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if there's just some Way, to do way that we can think of not having this do everything, but okay, but we can, fixed. yeah, yeah. Okay, Lynn, then I wonder. Yeah, I, I I hate to even bring this up, but I off I do wonder if there's any way to take the roads and sidewalks issue, which presently is estimated at about sixteen million. Mm -hmm. And put that in not as a one-time borrow project, but as a project that over time we get a better um, grip on. So almost as like almost like a separate yes. option here. Not saying we're borrowing for it, but saying we're allocating X number of dollars per year to that. Yeah. So it stands out separately. Yeah. yeah. Only because there are people who would choose roads and sidewalks over any other project. Right. And roads and sidewalks is complicated by the fact that we live in New England, and uh, as you repair roads, they deteriorate at the same time, and uh, so it's it's never quite that sixteen million dollars is somewhat of an elastic number. I found from having looked at that number over quite a number of years, uh, you, you you don't reduce it by the amount you put in in any given year because it's really a backlog and the backlog is something that builds by the erosion of roads. But uh, such is the complexity of our lives. Um, where we need to go is um, council and as a finance committee is that we need to be thinking about um, developing a capital plan for major building projects. And that's what this is really all about. And Sean and I have had this discussion both in this committee and with JCPC. And um, so I just want to touch base. We've recognized in this discussion that there's these questions. What can we build? What are the complexities? And then the uh, costs of the buildings that we're going to build are the ones we choose to build. And what's the timing and sequence? And those are variable decisions, and they have to be answered. And ultimately, the council needs, as the elected body, to make that decision 
Um, but we need to uh, get the wisdom of this committee to help that process along. We need to make sure that the public is involved, and then the question of JCPC is important too, because that is the body that includes representatives of the um, two other elected bodies, the school committee and the library trustees, who are very much our partners in this, and um, uh, our uh, school committee cares very much about that project. Um, and I can say the same for the library trustees about their project. And JCPC has been, is, is the forum which was really created originally to bring uh, those, the bodies together, including at that point the Select Board and Finance Committee as it was previously structured, to try and make decisions about major buildings. It kind of evolved into ongoing capital projects, but it started as a major building enterprise. So we need to be thinking about this question of how we are going to make those decisions, what are going to be the roles for the various bodies that I've mentioned, including the public at large, and how to get them involved, and then what the process is um, that we want to propose uh, for the council consideration and uh, through JCPC to the other elected bodies. So we've got a complex piece of work ahead of us, and uh, I, you know, we're obviously not going to do that today. Today was really to make sure that we had within this group a real grounding of understanding about what this whole thing is about and what the complexity of our problem is. But uh, the next stages of it is both procedural um, and substantive. And uh, I think that we probably, uh, as a practical matter, may need <laughs> to just have it be what is our next meeting date question so that we can pick up on the discussion that I just described to you and figure out how to go forward. But I wanted to um, sort of get us there at the end of this meeting because I think we need to know what it is, um, and these three guys need to know what they just signed on to. Uh, and uh, 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 so I don't know if there are any thoughts or comments about what I just summarized, any broad disagreement like I'm crazy or anything like that. Yeah, let me add to this that for a while at least the vision is that by sometime this fall that we would be utilizing our district meeting structures to go out and have some conversations with those people that want to show up. And I think for something like this, we'll find a good showing. Um, and again, that issue of how do you simplify the conversation, yet allow all of the um, very, very bright people in Amherst who would love playing with this model also have that opportunity. So, but the concept would be that, for instance, in the space of, say, two weeks, we might have a district meeting in each of the five districts and structure additional ways that the community can get back to us. Um, again, at that point, we're not gonna have a lot more firmer information than what we have now. Um, it's gonna be a matter of um, coming to reality about what we can do and what we can't do and hearing people's priorities, but understanding that the people who show up at meetings are not the only voice out there, that there, is a, a, there are other people who don't, don't come to the meetings. So if I were to put any um, condition on this, I would hope that by no later than the end of October, we were kind of out there talking about this, even earlier. Dorothy. I'm just wondering, um, the three new members, if you have any thoughts, crazy or otherwise, about better ways of involving the public. I mean, we had a, a forum, required forum. I don't even remember which one it was. 
uh, in which we had very few people come, even though it was a topic of great interest, but um, you know, how do we get out and find out what the public thinks and wants so that they get behind our projects? Hello? Uh, maybe uh, District 5 is unusual, but um, we have our two counselors and they have district meetings which are, we know when they are. They are the last Thursday of the month, except in the summer. Um, but people show up, you know, 30, 30, 35 people, plus they have a breakfast uh, 8 to 10 on, is it the second Thursday of every month? And they're scheduled and people show up. But that's always, seven and eight precincts, which is what five is now, have always been pretty active. Right. But I think if you have uh, an agenda, and uh, in the, the breakfasts are kind of, they are somewhat structured, but you can come with your ideas. And the bigger meetings, there is a, a program. Mm -hmm. and, and that's worked, but we're not, you're never going to get all the people out, that's for sure. And of course, the district meetings is what uh, Lynn was referring to. All districts have meetings. I think that some have been uh, more successful, but uh, they've all been successful to some extent. And I've attended district meeting at the Dorothy's district head at the Jones Library. Um, you know, I, I have a question. Um, of Lynn or of the group of us, um, if, and it's around the library, if our schedule isn't completely under our control because there's a grant decision that's been made and then we have six months to decide, um, it interacts very differently than all the other projects where we, we can make decisions. So uh, we are going to have to figure out timelines where th with that being it, it's just, it is different. Um, you know, this, the school, we don't even know whether we'll be in the budget piece, but we have one that will spark. Uh, and that was a question I got, you know, there's some things that are not in our control of when we want to make the decision. We'll have a six month limit on take the money or not. Uh, so just thinking in terms of when those district meetings happen, what people understand, what we're, we're faced with in terms of decisions out of this committee as well as out of the full council. I, I think we have to go in with and be honest about the assumptions we've made. There is also the possibility that the library could be put off for another year to J July 1st, 2021, because the amount of the t number one and number two is more than what the library people do. They could even ask to be put off another year, but it, we can't, we could sit here forever and keep guessing and wait for everybody else to make their decisions versus us being in charge of the bus. And I think it's time that we move, yeah, I mean, we take the leadership. There is a whole other piece here and uh, you know, Sean may not be prepared to talk much about it today, but once MSBA invites a community into the process, it sets, a whole process going and uh, you know that uh, we don't know we in you know we asked to get in this year and we'd be delighted if we got in this year because we're gonna have tremendous maintenance costs on the current buildings um, that are gonna build if we don't but um, it does get to be a process I think that I sent out to some people uh, a, uh, from meeting of the uh, Association of Town Finance Committees, which was an organization that we used to belong to, uh, which is for town finance committees, the uh, MSBA did a presentation for them that is a series of slides, and it was actually very informative about laying out what the whole building process is about. Uh, I think at some point we really need to understand that. Certainly if we got into the process, we'd need to understand it for sure. Um, but it, it's not like we can control. Uh, the process controls it. John? Yeah, I don't have any specific information, but you're right. There's a 
the feasibility phase would start procuring out all the designers and the OPM and everything like that, and then you'll be on that timeline that you work out with the MSBA. Um, so you'll have to make decisions, um, you know, along that timeline. So you're right; it starts us down a path that we don't have complete control over at that point. Good. Uh, so it seems that the one thing that we may have control over is the DPW. Empire. Empire. Well, but that has to come after. You have to knock down the, I mean, you have to, I, you have to put the fire, okay, you have to knock down the DPW, <laughs> put the fire, then which do, which do you do next? Actually, there is more than one answer here. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are ways to temporarily house DPW, so you could be engaged in both projects, and it's not necessarily the most desirable, but um, yeah, there's, one might say, yes, you've got to knock, you have to build a new DPW before you can build a new fire station because you need the property where DPW is. That's the very logical way to think about it. So there, there are, but, but I think what we're recognizing is just that there are pieces that are beyond our control mm -hmm. uh, at this point because we're waiting for grant decisions from two state agencies, library and schools. Uh, so, but I think we're still with the question of how to involve um, JCPC, the council, the public, um, are all um, sort of the ne um, next steps. I guess my suggestion I'm going to throw out there just so we can move this along and get in is that. Um, Two of us, Lynn and I, Lynn is president of the council in her role as president and as uh, chair of the finance committee and Sean uh, meet. Sean and I did do, and with Sean really doing all of the work, I have to give him the credit, a um, description of a month-by-month uh, -month process. Mm -hmm and kind of put it off because and we wanted to do this meeting first, mm -hmm. but we wanted to, get, wanted to get back to it after this meeting um, and uh, to see if we can take that and refine it and then bring it back to this committee um, to look at before, um, as a next step before, uh, and then go from this committee uh, probably to um, JCPC so it gets out to the others and to the council and uh, start getting feedback on it. So that would be my recommendation and if it's agreeable and I think we need to schedule a date for a committee meeting. Do you want that committee meeting to be just the finance committee or joint with JCPC? It's either is possible. I, uh, we could invite the JCPC members who are not members of this committee into the discussion. It would make for a larger discussion, but uh, it would enrich the discussion. But I think that we would. Uh, it might be that um, what we need to do is just get people to kind of give us um, by email um, vacation schedules so that we know when you're not available and we'll try and do our best. And I will ask, we can enlarge the circle on that and ask JCPC members also the same question and see if we can come up with the best possible date based on that, then we'll know when the three of us need to mm -hmm. come up with a, a model and I'll show you that was like. Can, can I also so make sure people do understand that remote participation is allowed? Um, it means that you're dealing with um, definitely audio and sometimes visual. Yeah, actually, that's a good point and one that we hadn't really thought about, and I should mention that for um, three of you who are not involved with it, that we do have remote participation rule now in place, and with the technology that we now have in this room, 
remote participation is easier than it used to be. What becomes complicated is when you get two people who are asking to remotely participate at the same meeting, such as in, especially if they're in wildly different time zones like <laughs> some of my friends have been known to do. Uh, but uh, the, uh, what, t what time was it in India when you were participating? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, this was a few conversations back about community involvement. One thing we've tried and was helpful is doing alternative district meetings in different locations, like senior center, and then we did another one in apartments, and we got a very different turn turnout and right. viewpoints. So that's something to really keep in mind. Hmm. Hello. Shall we do a, a doodle poll to people? Can, oh. What about a doodle poll for, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can do that uh, to find out availability. And uh, is it agreed that we should uh, include JCPC members? Yes. I, yeah. okay. Are we allowed to vote on that? Okay. <laughs> then, then we will do that. Uh, so, uh, We'll get the doodle poll together um, soon and it'll look for broad ranges because uh, this is vacation season. And we're and mainly talking about trying to set a time to meet in August, correct? Are we doing August and September? That's what we're looking at is both. Okay. And uh, then three of us will find the time separately to kind of take it from there. So um, I think that that, were there any budget updates, uh, Sonia? I know that the cherry sheets are not out until Friday. Right. So um, I guess if the cherry sheets are wildly different from what we expect, which I don't think they will be, let us know. and. Uh, Otherwise, I mean, because we have adopted the budget for um, this fiscal year that started on July 1st, and uh, we're just on course with that. And uh, we're far away from thinking about next year. Uh, so I have uh, nothing else to put forward as far as topics not anticipated 48 hours before the meeting. Um, is there anything else that uh, anybody else would like to? I, I just saw you have minutes here. Um, I think we're up to date except for uh, Anthony took minutes. Yes, and I have them to send to you, but they came while you were gone. Okay, I'd so get them so, to you. so you could just let me know, Sonia. The only other gap is when it was joint with council. It's the same set of minutes, but I'm supposed to redo something to send them to you to make them finance minutes. You know, so I'll just do it so you can post them. So I think we are actually up to date on minutes. Yes, I'll send you Anthony's minutes separately. Okay, so as that, if that's agreeable, I appreciate everybody's uh, sticking with it as long as they have. Thank you all very much. And uh, we'll, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we are adjourned at uh, 445, and uh, thank you. And I, uh, again, thank you for your volunteering to be a part of this committee, and I uh, hope it was understandable and not too scary. <laughs>